all right and more recently I, I i got to find out from one of the elders one of the older people what obroni means and he says obroni is basically saying abro ni abro abro means somebody who is just callous who treat you badly you know so both uh, the, both descriptions tell us that our ancestors were aware or their lives were transformed somehow after their contact with the Europeans. So to move it further, again, growing in Ghana, it wasn't a big deal. But moving to the U.S., it became a huge deal. So I was actually in the U.S. in 1993. And um, two years later, I participated in a Million Men's March. And also two years after that, I visited Boone Slave Plantation in South Carolina for the first time. So both of these experiences and the things I heard on the news, which we keep hearing today, transform, really gave me a different meaning of what race and racism um, was at the time. And again, Ahmed Diallo was killed at this, around the same time. So all these um, developments sort of started shaping my understanding. And as I've told some of you, my initial plan was not to be a historian, which I'm glad I'm a historian today. I'm really happy with my profession. I was initially supposed to be um, I was interested in architecture, so that's what I wanted to do in the U.S. But some of these things that I just described to you actually shaped my own um, conception of life, my own understanding of my profession, and I switched to become a historian. So that's how my journey started. I had to switch from the um, architecture to history. So I guess the first part of the question is the the my my understanding of um, race and blackness was shaped. And again, to take it further, we, we know that race is Western invention, it's Western construction, all right? It was specifically created for a purpose. There are several reasons. One of them is to create the other, the other person. And if you can define people by being the other, you don't want them to be called Ashantis, you don't want them to be called Zulus, you, don't, you, you ignore their identity and call them the other, it's easy for you to do what? Dehumanize them. It's easy for you to create justification for white superiority. So race over time was created for that reason. And this is how I got my understanding of race. So we, I'm going to move to the second question. The second question is how is my transatlantic research shaped by race and racism? Um, part of what I've said earlier covers it. But specifically, um, my study, my, my um, research on reverse migration, on slavery and others, exposed me to several other literature that I didn't know before. So for example, there are those who make an argument that um, slavery, Africans were enslaved because of racism. It's never true. Basil Davison has a great video series on YouTube that I, I, I use it in class every time. But that portion where it says Africans were enslaved because of racism is never true. There is no evidence for that. Rather, Africans were enslaved because they provided free labor. Europeans didn't care who they enslaved, all right? Before they went to Africa, they had enslaved other Europeans. The world history tells us that. So in, specifically with Africans, they were taken from their homelands to the new world because they wanted free labor. It was economics and it wasn't about racism. However, when the Africans arrived in a new world, we, we learned that that's when racism took a different shape. So for example, there, are two, there were two different groups of people that were brought into the new world around, maybe around, they overlap with each other a little bit. So I'll, I'll be talking about, beside the Africans, there were the um, indentured servants that were brought from Europe, all right? And if we read about indentured servants, there were Europeans that wanted free, they wanted to come to you. Um, they, they were promised free pass to Europe, to the new world that they, cre they claim they created. So they came into this new world. They worked for a period of time. And then what happened? They gave them land. All right. They were not dehumanized. They were treated as human beings. But the Africans on the other side was the opposite. They were dehumanized. They were counted as a fraction of a human being over time. So the two helps to show you the place of racism and race within the history of slavery, at least with my research. And I tell students every time, I'm teaching Introduction to Africana Studies this semester. And as we are dealing with issues with Black Lives Matter, we are dealing with, I, I feel like there is no better time to teach Intro to Africana Studies than this time. 
and we are making very good connections. I'm teaching students to understand how Europeans um, dehumanize Africans on the continent, say they were not humans, they didn't have a history, blah, 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 and how black people today are treated the same way. So the whole idea is to help students to make connections between the ancestors of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, with the Africans that they read about who were enslaved and brought to this place. So sometimes people tend to dis make the, I mean, disconnect the two. They were the same people. Enslaved Africans, the ancestors, uh, those that are in the new world today. But I think students appreciate that connection and what we are going through now and how that is linked together. So I also tell students that, listen, you know the story of indentured servants, and it's so strange. Most American students are clueless about their own history. So as an African, I have to spend time teaching them their own history to make that connection. So do you know who indentured servants are? If you're fortunate, few of them will make reference to what they learned in high school. Great, they will tell you, but they don't have the details. So I tell them that in order to, I, I explain to them that the difference is that indentured servants were given free land and Africans were not given. So if they want to understand why most black people today do not have land or why most black people keep saying, um, you guys have white privilege, you should understand that. I said, some of your own ancestors might be indentured servants that left Europe and came here. So if you've not done the research, I will urge you to just do the research. Who knows? Maybe the land that your ancestors are living on today, they will learn that your, um, your um, indentured servants ancestors passed on from generation to other. But I think that's very important because that helps to help students to understand why black people are still marching, why black people are still angry. All right? Because we don't have land. They, they treated our ancestors like animals. They were, better, they are basic, they were basically uh, uh, treated as properties, chattel slavery. So it's important to highlight that. So to answer the question about how that, that um, race and blackness is planted in my research, that's part of the, the story. Now, finally, um, the, the final one is, uh, da, 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 where is the third one? Okay. So the third question you want me to address is how did my experience and understanding of race and racism shape my professional development? So most of what I've told you already shapes my professional development. So to wrap up, I will tell you a little bit about my graduate experience. So I go to graduate school at the University of Illinois, very excited. Everything went well. I got a FLAS fellowship, Foreign Language Area Studies to study Kiswahili. That's how I went through graduate school. But when I was doing my PhD at the University of Texas, I learned so much that I didn't know before. So basically, actually, before I left Illinois too, I learned some few other things that I think is connected directly to racism and inequality, even in graduate school. So some of, most of the um, white students that I know were never asked to be teaching assistants in the classroom. They got all the fellowships that were available and the black students, the Africans were asked to teach. And of course they paid their school fees as part of it. But in my opinion, there was um, inequality even in graduate school at the point. I know several people who never did taught anybody. They spent all their time writing. So they, they were able to finish on time. While the non-white students always had to go around begging for funding. Now my story at UT Austin, which will wrap up the whole um, um, presentation. I remember when I was brought to UT Austin, I qualified, all right? Professor Falola was my, adre my advisor. In my third year doing my PhD, I remember the graduate coordinator when it was time to give um, all the graduate students, um, the graduate positions to guarantee our, wherever it is, our funding for the semester. One graduate um, coordinator, she's actually still working there now. She told me that we didn't bring you here, all right? So she, as a graduate coordinator, she tells me, it's not my responsibility to get you money to complete your, your program, all right? And, and this, the irony is that, thank God I finished graduate school. The Africana Studies program at the um, University of Texas supported me throughout the process. I graduated. Now I go to University of Central Arkansas. I, go, I went to Gettysburg College, did pre-doc, post-doc, and then got a, an assistant position at the University of Arkansas. That's where the turning point was. I was there and I knew I wasn't going to stay there. I knew I was going to look for a better job than that. And then I got a job at Lehigh University. All right. So during the transition of accepting a job, the University of Texas folks heard that Kwame is, has gotten a job at, University, at Lehigh University. 
And guess what the same graduate coordinator did? She put on their website, the history department website, oh, one of our great students got a job at Lehigh because Lehigh is a prestigious school, all right? But there's a person that never sent me one email when I was teaching at the University of Central Arkansas. The same person, this white lady who told me that she didn't bring me here, I should go find my own funding, did what? Put my name on the website. And that transitions well in the last phase of what I'm saying, which is the way black people are used. In academia, you're going to be asked to perform, all right? You have to perform your blackness. Most, all, almost all of us are qualified. We get into spaces because of merit. We are qualified just like anybody else. However, most institutions would love to have you around. And guess what? They want you to perform your blackness. So they want you to serve on every committee. Any program, they want to send you an email. I want you to come over here because they, are, they want to showcase you. Oh, we love black people. That's why we brought this individual. But if you look at the ratio of the number of black people in an institution compared to white people, it doesn't match. So you cannot just use me and tell me I should be everywhere and perform for you, perform my blackness and my black identity. Look, I don't have a problem. You can hire me if I'm qualified and you hire me. You can hire 100 black white people to teach the same subject. I don't care as long as I have that job, all right? However, in academia, you're going to find out that you are going to be used. You are going to be asked to perform blackness. And the truth is, you know, play the game as much as you can. There is something called a game, but a game does not have a rule. So you have to figure it out. So my, 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 my point here is we have to navigate, figure out how to navigate um, the, the process. It's a very complex process. I don't have a template for you to follow. But I think it's important, though, that as we navigate these processes, we pick and choose what we want to fight about. Prioritize your fight. Don't waste your time on things that will not help you in any way. Because at the end of the day, the same people that are perhaps racist towards you, they might be the same people that you need letters of recommendation from. So be careful you don't destroy those bridges. Get the game the best way you can. I'm yep. so sorry, but uh, we need to go on to the next speaker, but we really appreciate well, well, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the time. And if there's any time for Q&A, I'll be happy to. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Calvin. So Calvin, are you on? We're going to unmute you. Hi, everybody. Well, it's good to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from Western Kenya. It's a little rainy over here. I'm praying that uh, you are able to hear what I am about to say. And if it is so bad, then you let me know so that uh, we, we can slow it down. But if you are able to hear me, then I think I will proceed with my brief presentation. And I was asked by uh, Cliff to focus on three areas, basically one of which was my experience as um, as a black student in China, and then to juxtapose this against the notion of African experience and racism or race, and then look at the opportunities for growth in terms of uh, relations between uh, China and Africa. So as, as, as Professor mentioned in, uh, in, in his introduction, I think the ideological and the philosophical components of race and, 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 and how to look at it has been set out. So I'll just proceed to, to, to say that um, being in a different environment where people don't look like you can be sometimes threatening and does carry certain implications that uh, require um, a certain level of uh, understanding on how to navigate. So I first went to China in 2018. And while there, I did encounter some very inter interesting experiences. Uh, with regards to who I was as an African and what it meant to be in that space. And the first, of, the first component of it really had to do with something that I call ethnocentrism. The idea that probably some people are better placed, probably more handsome, uh, more clever, uh, better placed to handle things than um, you know, people from different uh, uh, races. And uh, this was uh, perhaps manifest, and um, it could just appear in terms of the way some people would relate to you. For example, when you go to the lecture hall, and then you meet people, and interestingly, 
while this was happening in China, we were, you know, students drawn from all over the world. So this was not uniquely Chinese experience per se, but even experience with people from Europe, uh, from the Americas, and sometimes for my own continent, you know, uh, Africa, while you can't call it racism or race relations, but some idea that maybe some, some, some people are better than others, uh, even within the continent. Um, so this, the second component of it has got to do with, uh, you know, structural racism. Those are the silent ways through which uh, people do express opinions or notions or attitudes about some people without, um, you know, um, uh, overt manifestation of exactly what they uh, really intended to say. And uh, what I experienced at some point was this sort of intrusive uh, curiosity where you find someone coming to you and asking you if, you, if your skin can come off if they touch it. Uh, I mean, that you, 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 you're moving uh, in the streets and somebody just stops you and asks, you're so different. And uh, they want to find out if your skin is okay. And then you let them touch your skin and then they, you see them laughing and they feel like it's just like their own. So I think there's, there's a, a, an idea of a, a intrusive curiosity that sometimes can sound like something way off. And this is because of sometimes cultural differences and inability to record what the other person's experience has been. As you may know that uh, over 90% of the Chinese have not traveled outside China. They don't hold passports. And you know how many they are, you know, 1.4 billion people. So that gives them quite a huge population that does not have a proper understanding of what the rest of the world uh, perhaps look like. And when they meet you, then there is the idea that they want to find out whether you are different or not. And much of their perceptions about the world, including Africa, has been um, cemented over time through stereotypes and narratives that may not really hold, um, you know, uh, water. Uh, is subjected to facts. Now, the third component is about um, outright um, or illegal acts, you know, like uh, what you remember what happened recently in Guangzhou, uh, where uh, African nationals were said to have been um, targeted in the fight against COVID-19. Um, I do know people who are in that kind of scenario. And uh, this was happening in China. Um, brought a lot of uh, talk around the idea of race, and how for a long time the African people and um, perhaps thought that uh, their Chinese counterparts had this understanding that they had similar perhaps um, ideological background given that uh, they experienced um, things like colonialism, they experienced things like uh, difficulties in economic uh, uh, situations, you know, that they are both classified up to now as developing economies and so the idea that uh, this camaraderie was broken very brutally because of COVID-19, when African population thought that uh, the Chinese could understand, uh, you could see the kind of shock and uh, backlash that came with that. So you get this kind of snippet things. And, and race, for example, for Africans uh, in China is not a new thing. It has been documented back to the 1960s. Although it's also important to add that Chinese uh, econo uh, society is rather closed and therefore not very many Africans have had access to that uh, society. So the relationship, the interactions have not been as strong uh, as Africa has had with the rest of the world, say Europe, for example, which um, has its uh, roots, for example, in colonialism and, uh, and, 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 and long years of interaction. So in terms of what I think about in terms of opportunities for improving what is going on, especially between Africans and Chinese. Now, I think most people still do take what they know uh, from second-hand uh, information sources or from, uh, you know, pedal biases and, and, and prejudices. And I think there's a, a, a very strong need for information exchange, especially between African and Chinese counterparts. And this can be facilitated through uh, mainstream media as well as social media. We've seen a lot of Chinese media presence in Africa. Uh, all the mainstream media, major channels have bases in Africa, posted in Nairobi for now. But I think there's a lapse when it comes to African media um, you know, covering China. African media outlets still heavily rely on wire services from the West. And therefore, I think it's important for African media 
and African um, journalists to do a, a little bit of more focus in terms of the Chinese uh, uh, society so that the African population can better understand what is happening in China. The second one is, uh, uh, I think, a strong need for uh, intercultural uh, communication and promotion of people-to-people -people exchanges. It's still very weak. Um, and, and I think there's an opportunity here. We've seen a lot of Africans um, trying to access China now in terms of uh, trade and business opportunities. And a lot of Chinese are now finding their way into Africa either through employment opportunities or surplus labor and all this. So that interaction can create a better understanding. Uh, and this then leads to a more, uh, what I would call, a more structural approach that would ensure some level of sanity in the debate about race, especially between Africans and, and, you know, and, and, and Chinese. And this has got to do with implementation of um, some legal protocols that ensures that people are protected, even if you don't like someone, but you can't respect that someone. You do not have to violate their space. And doing so means that there should be some uh, legal uh, provisions to protect people who are not Chinese from uh, unnecessary antagonism, especially when they are in, um, uh, in, in China. At individual level, I do pray that uh, people can have something uh, to do with cultural sensitivity and, uh, and cultural intelligence. The idea that people are different and therefore they are going to come into your life in a different way, that you don't have to necessarily understand people. But as long as you have the, uh, the knowledge and understanding that uh, even if you don't appreciate someone, there are certain legal provisions that protect their rights, that ensure they are safe, that, in, that protect uh, their intellectual, uh, uh, physical, and emotional well-being without necessarily having to uh, be in complete uh, amity with such people. So that, to me, has been uh, my experience uh, in China as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a black student. And as Professor mentioned, there is this challenge uh, when it comes to African nationals, either you know, you know, dealing with um, the other people from elsewhere, the idea that some people feel that you are free labor, you know, that you can be used. I have encountered that. I had a, an opportunity to, to do some work with um, a Chinese think tank, and they had to insist that um, if I was going to, for example, work on a paper, then I have to give names and contact uh, information of the sources that I was going to interview. And I thought that was really um, way out of it. And this has been the case also when I was dealing with even an American uh, you know, friend who also had to insist on work being done, but no compensation. When I know that he's been compensating, compensating other colleagues who've been doing similar things. So I guess um, we, we, we can I'm so fix sorry. This. Excuse me, Mr. Calvins. Um, I yes, might have please. to cut you short uh, so that we can go to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your patience and, 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 and listening. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Michael, if you could go next. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, yeah. Uba didn't ask me to focus on those three areas that the um, first two speakers um, focused on. So I'm probably going to take less than the 10 minutes. I'm just um, going to look at the issue of identity. My experience in the, in the U.S. has really um, brought to the fore of who I am. And so for me, that is um, what my presentation pretty much is going to focus on. Um, Dr. Asian said um, a lot of the things that I, I wanted to say, um, I will try not to repeat most of the things he said. So number one, um, as, a, as, as a Ghanaian in, in the U.S. and specifically in, in Miami, um, when you talk to people and they hear your accent, you know, the first thing they, they, they ask you, some people will tell you you have an accent. <laughs> you, you have an accent, then they will ask you, where are you from? You know, I mean, before here, I did an exchange program in Finland. And it's, it's okay if... Uh, if someone saw me in, in, in the streets in Finland and asked me where um, I was from, I mean, that is understandable because most Finnish people are white people, but not in America when we have a lot of blacks. But once they hear you speak, then they know you're not from here. So they're going to ask you, where, where are you from? And, and this question is, um, for me, it's, an, it's, 
it's, it's a question that makes me reflect because look in Ghana, like Dr. Asian um, said, I didn't have to think about the fact that I am I'm even black. We take being black for granted. Everybody is black, uh, and so it, it's it's not a big deal being black. Um, usually, in Ghana, I would I would see myself as number one as 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 an Asante or what you call Ashanti. That is what I would first see myself as. If, if Ghana was playing um, a soccer um, football match with, um, say, another African country, then um, I would I would see myself as a Ghanaian because we all come together to support our um, football team. So I I never had to think of myself as black. But here, um, I think you know, of who I am as first as a black person. And even when you tell people that, I mean, even people see that you're black, you're talking to a fellow African-American, is it going to ask you, okay, wh where are you from? And this is an African-American. So it, being black is even not just enough. I'm an African, you know, and it wasn't something that I would think about, you know. So I think about that. And like I said, in Ghana, these were not things that we usually would think about. But I wouldn't say that. Race is a complete non-issue in Ghana because, you know, I've read um, the predicament of blackness and I know that uh, it, there are things that we don't know, but they are, they are with us, you know. And also, so for instance, I had an experience with, um, with a friend from the Caribbean and um, I, I had al always thought that central to our identification as black people is the continent. So you talk to, I remember talking to a friend from the Caribbean and, and then I told him that um, he's African and he had to stop me and tell me, no, he's not African, he's um, Caribbean. And, and so I also thought about that because before that, I'd always thought of blackness as this um, monolithic experience that if you're black, that there is just one thing called being black. But then you realize that being black means many things. And... Um, so, which means my definition of, of blackness hitherto was uh, my experience here in the U.S. was very exclusionary. You know, like when you read um, uh, Physics of Blackness, uh, Michelle Wright, you know, challenges you to um, go beyond the middle passage epistemology in your definition of blackness. That I was confronted with that. I thought about it. And then I realized, you know, I don't just have to think of, of, of blackness in that simple way you know, that blackness can be seen in, in manifold ways. So that was also very important to me as I thought about, you know, um, I reflected on, on identity, you know, what does it mean to be a black person? And, you know, Dr. Asian talked about his experience as a graduate student. I think that is very telling and probably it's, it's, it's okay if I don't even, I don't talk about mine. I think, what, for, but what I've observed is that most departments have, um, Blacks are underrepresented in most departments. So he tells me it's a cause of it's a cause for concern because it tells me that after my PhD, um, compared to uh, a white person that holds the same PhD, it will be more challenging for me to get a job. You know, being a black person, because uh, like I said, it's, a, it's an observation, something that I've seen that most departments you have very few black people, and the speaker just before me talked about his. Um, his everyday lived experiences as um, um, he walks uh, in the streets. Uh, so one may ask, what are, what are my everyday lived experiences? What I would say is that in America, a lot of people try to be, you know, a lot of people try to be politically correct, try to be polite, try to be kind. So most of the times, my experiences haven't been really bad. You know, people are nice. I go to church. Uh, they're very um, nice people. But I've also had um, very, some crazy experiences not too crazy experiences because sometimes i'll be walking on the on the sidewalk and then you see um a white mostly the women like a white woman or a latina approaching and when they see you they kind of you know go off the 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 sidewalk and then walk past you because you know you're a black person and um, they feel threatened just by the fact that you're black you know um you enter a store and the fact that you black people keep an eye on you you know as if you're just there to go shoplift or something else 
you know, when you when you go to a store a couple of times, they get to know you. They know you're not there to do anything bad. They become like friends. But for the first few times, it's like oh, this is a black guy probably gonna pick, take something. So some sometimes you have these experiences. They're not too pleasant, especially when I juxtapose it with them. The way we treat like white people in Ghana, in Ghana, we see white people and it's almost like they're next to Jesus Christ. You know, um, you even have you know uh, situations where white people are treated even better by Ghanaians than their own fellow Ghanaians. Then you come here and it's, it's, it's the other way around. So for me, my apart from these um, everyday lived experiences, I think one the most important thing that I've had to grapple with, deal with is uh, my identity of uh, I mean, who I am as a black person and, and my understanding of this, um, the fact that you can be black, but not just black in a, a very limited way that I understood it, that you can be black in many ways, but we are still, all of us are black people, you know? So um, I will end here. And pretty much this has been my experiences as a, as a black scholar in, in the United States of America. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate you taking your time to be with us today. Um, our next speaker is Carrie. Um, you can take the floor. Um, if you could kindly unmute. Thank you. Okay, greetings to everyone. Broadcasting here live from Miami, Florida <laughs> in the United States. Um, um, blackness. What is it? Um, my research treats this question as central and guiding. Um, as I explore and interrogate histories of Black Caribbean integration and assimilation into the United States during the 20th century. Uh, most recently, my research has investigated the history of Richard B. Moore's decades-long campaign near the end of his life against the name Negro, as evinced in his seminal text, first published in 1960, called the name Negro, its origin and evil use. In both the campaign and the text, Moore, a black immigrant to the United States from Barbados, excoriated the, the term Negro from a multiplicity of vectors, utilizing history-based, etymologic, and semantics-driven arguments and campaigns. So central to today's discussion on navigating non-black spaces from a transnational black perspective is Moore's example in originating and orchestrating this movement by using a direct frontal attack on typical bastions of white intellectuality and influence, as well as those poised in supposed counterposition to that white supremacist notion. Moore's first campaign target was the New York Times, which in the 60s was already an American and global standard in reporting news and events from around the world to an international and increasingly interconnected globalizing world. At the center of the campaign was what was to become almost an incessant and repeated request. All public outlets must stop using the term Negro generally, but especially to people originating from the African continent. In his first letter to the Times Moore stated as saying, and I quote, your frequent use of the name Negro for the indigenous people of Africa has aroused considerable concern and growing resentment. Moore continued, it is hard to understand and impossible to accept this usage. And in addition, the committee he formed, the campaign to tell the truth about the name Negro, urges you to adopt the name Afro-American for people of African ancestry in this country Okay. Three years later, in 1963, Moore could claim an even more broad reception of this anti-Negro stance. In a special Christmas time press release in 1963, Moore and his fashion committee to present the truth about the name Negro um, uh, championed the anti-Negro stance taken by Kwame Nkrumah and other African leaders in Ghana, where they simultaneously had eschewed the usage of the term Negro for Afro-American when referring to Blacks from the United States. Moore's inferred influential dialogue with Nkrumah on the African continent hinted at the potential for transnational dialogue and cooperation that would become more prevalent in subsequent decades of uh, synchronic struggle against colonialism, apartheid, and racism across the Black Atlantic. 
on Africa and Europe and the Caribbean and in North America. Again, relevant to this talk today is the method of engagement employed by Moore at the inception of his campaign against the term Negro. In selecting the New York Times as his primary target, Moore, Moore exemplified an option in how to navigate a non-black space from a pointedly non-white and categorically black vantage point. Unapologetic frontal confrontation. As stated by Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton in their influential Black Power, The Positive of Liberation, a goal of exhibiting Black Power is full participation in the decision-making process affecting the lives of Black people and recognition of the virtues in themselves as a Black people. So Moore's decision to self-publish and sell the text privately proves his awareness to reading the latent demand that had built up in African America's social conscience up to that point. Touré and Hamilton continue, Black people must redefine themselves as only they can do that. So Moore's text and campaign um, is right on that point. It's, it's responding to it. It's offering a pliable alternative in presenting the term Afro-American. There's a growing, quote, there's a growing resentment of the word Negro. The term is an invention of our oppressor. It is in his image of us that he describes, right, wrote Touré and Hamilton in that 1967 text. Now, as had become standard in the revolutionary 60s, Moore and his campaign utilized this approach in the popular movement for civil rights in the South, Direct, nonviolent, yet highly visible protest was employed to litigate change in white dominated literary news space. Underreported in most civil rights histories, Moore's campaign proved an indelible aspect of the civil rights movement of the United States North. Though it was joined by subjects of contemporary historical interest like Queen Mother Moore, Black bookstore owner Louis Michaud, as well as more noted figures like Langston Hughes and popular civil rights attorney Percy Hutton, the story of this campaign has yet escaped more regular and noted attention. But I think it's pertinent to the discussion we've been having today. The campaign against the name Negro offers a historical example of promoting a transnational black navigation network of the world and society that is supposedly dominated by whiteness. Moore's novel leadership in the 60s campaign However, it was just a characteristic of his long and sometimes storied career of rights activism, which involved more since the 1920s. President of the Harlem Tenants League, General Secretary of the League of Struggle for Negro Rights, Moore had been among the earliest and most prominent leaders of the American Communist Movement, emanating from its ideological hearth in Harlem, uh, in the Harlem neighborhood of New York City. In this role, Moore led an evolving communist policy on the party's self-titled Negro question. Moore even served as the prosecuting attorney against white chauvinism in the Yokonin show trial of 1931, a communist-led attempt to exercise racism from its ranks. The Barbadian Moore, who never pursued U.S. citizenship and died a Barbadian national on Barbadian soil at the age of 85 in 1978, even found himself centrally involved in the Scottsboro trial of the 1930s as the guardian and spokesperson for the Scottsboro Mothers, guiding them on four cross-country tours of the United States and internationally. While the approximate location of Scottsboro places it within the center of the United States, quote, unquote, black belt, long-standing anti-black racism, you know, evidenced by the Scottsboro case itself during the era of Jim Crow, certainly provides a vivid historical example of Moore's aggressive yet adroit navigation of this non-black, anti-black managed space, okay? Even earlier, Moore had been an influential member of the militant African Blood Brotherhood, an association created in advocacy and defense of black people in the United States and aiming to do so internationally. Also headquartered in Harlem, the Brotherhood first worked intimately with and then passionately against Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association before melting into the then nascent American Communist Party. So I'll end here. Blackness as an interpolation of racial theory, which posited a slave status and various other negative ideologies on our identity based on the color of our skin, relative features and supposed commonplace of origin Africa, still plays an inordinate role in the procession of outcomes and opportunities presented in the United States and across the West today. And we've heard that from uh, the previous speakers. 
and most of these continue to be carried out in non-Black managed spaces. Richard B. Moore, like few others involved in the 20th century struggle for dignity and human rights of Black people, again, offers a unique historical template by which his lifelong example of scholarly activism can be evaluated and taught to others. Dogs and slaves was, quote, dogs and slaves are named by their masters. Moore is reported to have said regularly on the campaign trail. Challenging the idea of formal human difference, race, driven by labeling and objectification associated with being branded black or Negro, colored, African-American or anything else, uh, the issue of identity continues to be a source of reevaluation and reconsideration. As black people, we, the racialized subjects of the American social order, still attempt to navigate an insistently white superstructure of national and societal values that has only been bent through methods of direct confrontation and challenge, which is demonstrated by Moore and others. In almost every decade of his life, Moore sought to create and utilize transnational networks of blackness, even as he consistently challenged the concept of race at its core. While he never was a member of the academy, Moore became an activist and a bibliophile who worked to create this blueprint or map to challenge this idea of anti-blackness and exclusionary space at its core. And uh, I'll end there um, and I'll respond to any questions uh, that that presentation may, may have you know, evinced at the end. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, our next speaker is Chip. Welcome. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually in Idaho, which is in a mountain west of the U.S., but I'm from Malawi. And um, Dr. Uba actually asked me to <clears throat> address a few questions, but mostly um, he asked me to address uh, my, <clears throat> my experiences uh, as an international student in the U.S., particularly in this region in the mountain west. I still call you Dr. Uber. I know you're not the doctor yet, but I still call you Dr. Uber. You're getting there. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, and also I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> how that experience tell, I mean, tells us about uh, trans transnationalism or blackness. And uh, one of the other questions was that... Um, one one of the other uh, issue that I had to address was um, about the experiences of race um, and colorism in Southern Africa. I'm probably the only uh, person in, in this panel. So I may be wrong, but uh, probably uh, I'm the only one from Southern Africa. Um, so Malawi is in the South Central Africa, but we still consider ourselves as Southern Africa. So. Um, I want to say that uh, race uh, in Southern Africa is uh, is an interesting topic and also a bit different from other parts of Africa. Uh, in a sense that um, white people, when white people came to Africa, especially Southern Africa, they came to stay. So it wasn't it wasn't like uh, in other parts where they just stayed on the coast. Uh, in Southern Africa, they came to stay. Um, mostly it was, uh, it, began, it began with the Portuguese who came to South South Africa and Mozambique as they were going to India. And then they were hauled by the Dutch, um, <clears throat> also called the Boers. So the Dutch and the Portuguese settled in Southern Africa in large numbers. Um, Eventually, that number uh, of, of those two groups was followed by the British. But mostly, I, I um, for my research, uh, white people who came from Netherlands and Portugal and the UK uh, <clears throat> came because of good weather. Um, they also came because of um, good soil. And <clears throat> the Southern Africa is very, it's, it's savanna, most of the 
uh, countries there. So uh, they don't really have, I mean, didn't have a lot of uh, other factors that would stop settlements like in West Africa where they had a lot of mosquitoes and malaria and stuff. So uh, as most of us know what happened in South Africa, eventually uh, white people settled in South Africa and they found gold minerals and, and settled there like they were staying there forever. So Mozambique, the Portuguese settled in Mozambique uh, as if they were going to settle there for the rest of their lives. So they invested a lot in that. And the Boers, the Dutch and the um, British also settled in South Africa in large numbers. And they settled there as, as if they were going to settle there for the rest of their lives. So in 1949, South Africa, the, the, um, the Boers gained power and instituted a uh, system of apartheid, as people know. So apartheid segregated races in terms of uh, white people being on top, uh, Indians uh, in the middle, and uh, the mixed race people called coloreds, then black people were at the bottom of it. So um, apartheid, I would say that um, the uh, the institution of apartheid had actually big uh, inf uh, impact on Southern Africa as a whole, because Southern Africa is uh, probably the only part of Africa that had a very difficult time gaining independence. I would say because of that issue, because it wasn't it wasn't just in Mozambique and South Africa. You had Zimbabwe too. Zimbabwe has a large population of white people who settled there, mostly British settlers. And Southwest, Southwest Africa too, which is what right now what we call was uh, um, Namibia. Namibia has had a large, uh, or still has a large population of white people uh, who were from, mainly from Germany and some who, who came from South Africa as well. So um, I'm not gonna go in deep into uh, what apartheid was all about and everything, but I just wanted to show that um, the institution of apartheid and white settlement in South Africa had actually impacted Southern Africa in a way that <clears throat> it was very difficult for uh, countries in those in that part of Africa to actually gain independence uh, at the same time as other parts of Africa were gaining independence because it was mostly about white people had created an institution of governments and uh, black people at the bottom who didn't really have any uh, capacity to actually remove them. So, um, that, and uh, as a result of um, white settlement, we also had a large population of Indians who were most supported by the British. Like in Malawi, we, we, <clears throat> we have a, a small population of white people, but we have a large population of Indians. And since uh, independence in 1964 to the present day, these these uh, groups of people had been uh, always being antagonistic, especially uh, Indians and black people. Uh, and it was Indians control the economy, as we call it, or the levers of economy. And black people are mostly in the other sectors. So this can also be manifested in other parts of Southern Africa, in Mozambique, in Zambia, and, and, and the rest. So I uh, just wanted to give that, that preview of uh, how Southern Africa uh, has been uh, in terms of um, how it has actually tackled the issue of race or how it came about as compared to other parts of Africa because I feel like Southern Africa had been a bit different. And um, I want to move on to uh, my experiences as a black person uh, as an international student right here in the U.S. So I would say that I grew up a little bit sheltered. I grew up in a country where everybody uh, is, uh, not everybody, but the majority of people are black people. Just like uh, other um, panelists have said in Ghana, Malawi is probably similar in, in terms of uh, like uh, configuration. So I grew up with people who look like me most of the time. So I didn't really, uh, I didn't really um, deal with the issue of race until probably when I was in secondary school. That was the first time that I had interacted with white people. So my, my, my uh, 
my view on race was very limited, not an non-existent, but very limited on um, those uh, on that uh, relationship with others. So um, when I came, when I first came to to the US, I went to Wyoming. So uh, Wyoming is pretty white, say. I don't know, like, I don't know percentages, but it's like very, very white. <laughs> they don't have like white people there. So I remember my family asking me, like, uh, so uh, is Wyoming a city, is it a town? Because, I mean, I didn't know what Wyoming, where Wyoming was. I just found it online and applied there because I like the campus. So, <laughs> so, um, I was very excited going to the U.S. for the first time and everything. I had actually heard about African American experiences or African experiences in, in the U.S. in general, but I just wanted to experience it on my own. Like, is it true about the friction between African Americans and Africans? How am I going to navigate through that? How are Africans treated in Wyoming? Because I heard about like why I'm in California, New York, but I didn't know anything about Wyoming. So when I went to Wyoming, I was so excited. I was there, I was happy in the US. But I think at some point I tend to not notice some of the nuances of race relations in the US because I was too excited. So I didn't notice all these things. Uh, I remember one time I, I went to church, there was a, a, pers a person, a white dude, who was uh, asking me all the time, like, come to my church, come to my church. And I was like, no, I don't, you know, I'm kind of busy, I'll come. But because he, I was, I think he was, I was just tired of him. This other time he just asked me, can you come to my church? And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll come. So I went to his church and one thing I noticed is that when I went there, almost everybody was white. And this person had just vanished because he had some responsibilities. I think it was like a church order or something. And... People started coming, I mean, people who came to me, started coming to me, the people who came to me were older people, like older people asking me, like, because they were, they were shocked. They were like, what are you doing here? Where are you from? Because they noticed my accent. And um, <clears throat> I was like, okay, I'm from Malawi and all that stuff. But then other people, I think young people were the most, uh, I think the ones, the, the ones who actually exhibited uh, animals towards me because I couldn't really understand why people would not talk to me especially young people and when it came to uh, when I went to sit down in a church I sat on the middle so there was this huge space on the other end but no one would come to sit near me so uh, people actually go around and go to, to sit on the uh, my uh, <clears throat> the next you know Chair, chairs that were behind me but they wanted to sit next to me because I was on the middle and there was this large space and that was my first experience I would say of, of racism it was kind of shocking really shocking because I was like oh so this is real so this is this is how people are and the most shocking thing was that this was happening in a church something that you know I could not comprehend so and after that that's when I started noticing uh starting grasping these uh, things about <clears throat> black people, especially talking with other Africans who had lived there for a while and saying, okay, this is Wyoming and this is how people are like. So it was kind of very, it was kind of interesting to actually experience that. And also, I remember my first interaction with African Americans. And I've always, I've always admired African Americans, the culture, and I would say that black people everywhere, we are all connected. And I have a saying that uh, the indignity of black race everywhere has to do with Africa as, as a continent, the failure of Africa to develop. You might disagree oh, on that. Chief, um, excuse me, um, I have to cut you off, but thank you so much for sharing with us your experiences. We really appreciate and um, hope to hear from you. All right, thank you. Minnesota. Um, our next speaker is Duncan. Um, welcome. Uh, okay, thank you. I think I think I'll, I'll start my presentation with uh, on on a light note uh, to share a story of uh, of my experience. 
one time when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I was in, uh, when I went to South Korea, and I remember meeting someone and asking me that, uh, oh, I have a friend of mine in, in, in South Africa. Do you, do you know my friend in South Africa? You know, but, but I come from Kenya. I'm just starting this on a light note just to, to give you uh, a little uh, issue in terms of my understanding of race. For me, I think I've, uh, for the last three years, I've, I've, I've stayed out of, of, of Kenya. And uh, for me, my understanding of racism uh, it all goes about discrimination. It's all about issues of discrimination, but not just any form of discrimination. But again, these are socially constructed uh, discrimination. But at the same time, also they were just created for social and political reason. And uh, I want to start by sharing, um, like in Europe, I've lived in Europe, and I was doing a, a, um, a master's in. Uh, and Erasmus Mundus master's program. So this master's program allows you to do your master's in, uh, in three to four university. So I had a chance to live in, in, in the UK. And then I did another semester in, 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 uh, in Denmark. Then I did another semester in France. Then I did another semester in Portugal and later in another, in another semester in Poland. So during this period, uh, what I came to understand uh, living in Europe, but again, living in Europe at a time whereby there's the anti-migration uh, uh, rhetoric going on. At the same time, you also know the political discourse in Europe uh, is against uh, uh, migrants. And uh, also the, there's a growing number of, uh, of uh, you know, we have a lot of these right-wing parties also growing in Europe at this particular moment. Uh, so you find that in continental Europe, uh, there's the term of immigrant, foreigners, are used both to describe, at the same time also to construct people as racialized others. Uh, so you find a lot of uh, structural racism exists. Uh, for example, uh, you find uh, either some people where you people are working, because I also had another opportunity to work in, in Geneva, and you find that in workplaces, most senior position, most senior position are occupied by white people. And you find some of these senior position, they are position that maybe they uh, directly targeting um, developing countries, but most senior positions uh, are, are, are held by white people. And just a recent study shows that there's a study which was done by the UN, United Nations uh, showing how racism exists within the United Nations. And maybe with time, I'll, I'll also share the, the study here so that you can understand that there's, there's, a, there's a summary of this. And also you find that in, in the labor market in Europe, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, the black people or uh, minority, they're the people who live in poor neighborhood, uh, whereby houses are cramped and, uh, and they're seen as uh, discriminated others, even in, the, in terms of uh, uh, getting a place to rent. So if in Europe, in some countries, it will be very difficult for you to find a place to rent if, uh, if you're not from, uh, from there or necessarily, I mean, if, if you're black. Uh, having said that, I want also to, to give you a, a, another, another scenario, and this scenario was done in, in uh, there's a research which was done in Netherlands. In, this was in 2015, before, the, before we, what we call uh, the, refuge, uh, the, the migration crisis, whereby a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people now moving to, uh, from 2015, a lot of uh, African crossing Mediterranean moving to Europe. And in 2015, I mean, in, in 2005, there was a study which was done in, uh, in the Netherlands, and this, this, I just want to share this to show you how uh, discrimination happens in terms of workplaces, or you as a student, as a black student, living in, 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 in Europe, for you to get even a student job is not that easy. So there was, uh, there's, an there's, a, there's a website that is called uh, www.elgem.nl. So they did a study whereby they were 150, there were some jobs which were advertised, and then they adopted 100 CVs uh, for this uh, job which were advertised. And they were, they were sent to a number of companies in the, in the Netherlands. So half of them carried traditional Dutch name, and the other half foreign or Islamic sounding name. So out of these 150, you find that 75 Dutch, in quote, uh, CVs, 69 people were invited for a job interview. And the other 75, of foreign CVs, only 33 people were invited for an interview. Interestingly, after the interview, 51 people who had like Dutch sounding name 
got respondents and they were hired. And only two of the ethnic minority got a job. So this shows you the way in some countries, if a country like Denmark, for example, they know, you know, the Danish name. You cannot just be given, you cannot just give birth to a child and name them anyhow. They are there are, there are some approved Danish names where you can, how you can, I mean, where you can name uh, your kids. So this shows you that uh, how, as a student, navigating this issue of racism in Europe can be a little bit tricky. So having said that, I want to share with you also my personal experience. When I was living in the UK, I, I lived in, um, in a small uh, city called Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln is predominantly white. So I remember one time I went to the supermarket. So when I went to the supermarket, I was looking for, for something. I think I was looking for cream fresh. I went to Tesco. So when I went to Tesco, uh, it's one of the, the biggest uh, uh, supermarket chain in, in the UK. So then I, I went to an aisle and I was asking some white attendant, hey, where can I get, uh, where can I get, uh, I mean, cream fresh? And the guy literally looked at me and walked and said nothing. And when he passed, he just clicked and he went. And uh, this one of the, this one showed me that one, from the way the guy reacted, it was purely, I mean, it was racial discrimination in my opinion. Also, I also want to share like in Denmark, in Denmark also, it was a little bit difficult to get accommodation because in certain areas, they don't want black people, they don't want people, uh, minority people to live there. Or sometimes if you're, if you're looking for accommodation and then you go there, in most cases, if you will live in shared apartments, so what happened when somebody moves out, then um, the, the roommates will hold like an interview to interview the next person to move in. So in most cases, you'll go and uh, you have a good chat with the, with, with the people, with, with, the, with, the, with the people who are doing this interview, to have your, their new roommate, and literally you'll never hear from them. So only to realize that uh, maybe somebody was picked, they, they didn't want somebody who is black because some will claim maybe our food, the way we cook our food, maybe the food is a bit, little bit smelly and all that. So you will always be discriminated based on that line. And again, uh, in Portugal, Portugal is, is a very interesting, is a very interesting country because, I mean, people don't talk about racism openly. Uh, it's a very warm country and you'll find like people are very friendly. But if you're very keen enough also, you realize that it exists. There are a lot of, uh, uh, racial discrimination that exists within if, if in if in um, if in lisbon for example or if you go deeper in in some of the the, the small cities and uh, from all this experience uh, there is uh, i mean what i've learned uh is that there is anti-migrant anti-migrant political discourse uh, and again also tighter migration control within Europe is also fueling some of these uh, issues around uh, racial discrimination because you find politicians using the issue of migration openly to gain popularity. So with this, you know, when, with, with this growing number of uh, right-wing political parties, if you read, you'll find that a lot of countries, be it in, uh, in Western Europe or Eastern Europe, there's a lot of, this, a lot of uh, anti-migration anti rhetoric going on and these are really fueled the way other people, the way people see people from other, from other, from, a, from other countries, not necessarily white, but even people from Asia and all that. So you find that, what I've also learned, I think, looking at my experience and imagine this, some, I have legal documents, so I had legal documents to stay in the country. So I'm trying to imagine how is it for somebody who is not legally who doesn't, or maybe somebody who has uh, expired legal documents, how do they survive in this type of environment? Because imagine for someone who has all the papers, but you still find it very difficult to navigate this, uh, this space. So you also find that uh, to address this issue, I think uh, social media can play a very key role uh, to raise awareness in discrimination and, and racism acti uh, racist activities in my opinion. So going forward, these are some of the take home uh, for me that uh, for, for this issue to be addressed, I think it needs to be addressed at the political level.
because it's also being fueled at the political level. Uh, to give you a case in, a, in, in point, at one time, uh, I did a research and I was looking at political discourse and, and, and migration in Denmark. And I interviewed, uh, <coughs> sorry, I interviewed a participant, one of the res responded and told me that I think at one point, um, maybe 2014 or 2015, there's a, there's a, there's a politician who openly said, who openly confronted uh, a young Muslim uh, student on national TV and telling them that whether, because this, this kid had, uh, one parent was Danish and another one was, 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 was I think was from Turkey or, uh, or Syria, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not very sure. And on the national TV was being told that whether you're born here, whether you're part of, one of your parents is from, from this country, but you're not, you're not Danish. So you find that there is this notion of uh, people wanting to keep like pure breed, especially in, in some of these Scandinavian countries. But again, uh, they also feel that when people come to the country, they take their, you know, these are, these are, they, they depend on social welfare. So they also think that when you come in and you want to disrupt their, their, their way of life, the social welfare. So I think going forward, I think for this issue to be addressed, there need to be a good, political, I mean, political goodwill for the issue of racism or for, for the issues of discrimination that exist within, uh, within Europe, there need to be a political goodwill for this to be uh, resolved. So that's my presentation. I think uh, we'll answer some questions uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the speakers who have joined us here today. We really appreciate uh, you taking your time. So. At this point, um, we have one last speaker, but he's not able to join in. And so we'll just open it up for questions and answers and some discussion. Hello, everyone. My name is Travis Dozier. I'm pursuing a master's at FIU in international and intercultural education. I'm pursuing a graduate certificate in um, African and African diaspora studies. I have an undergraduate certificate in Afro-Latino studies. I'm the current president for the African and African Diaspora Studies Graduate Student Association. And I would like to say, I would like to thank every last one of the speakers, the diverse, the diverse um, ideas and uh, perspectives of what it is to be black in a white space. And speaking from my experience, I grew up in West Georgia, East Alabama, and I went to a majority white school system. I was in the U.S. military for 10 plus years. So I was stationed in white nations like Germany for eight years, Washington State, and Missouri and all the places I've traveled, I, I can say I have a PhD in white supremacy, which I don't call supremacy, I call it white insecurity, because in order to be supreme, you don't have to feel like you have to rule everybody. But just listening to some of the, um, everybody experiences of how, you know, you found out, you know, what this black construct was, it brought a lot of understanding to me, because I, I for the longest grew up in Georgia and Alabama, and I would say an African brother and sister, and I'll talk to him. It was a lot of, you know, um, estrangement at first, but, you know, we get past that. So just pretty much seeing how things are strategically done, things are on a grander, state, grander scale, is strategically done to disconnect us from who we are. So I just want to say more of a um, comment, and I really appreciate this whole dialogue and discourse. Actually, I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I, I have a question to Kerry. Kerry, can you talk a little bit about um, the uh, b the guy you, you were um, talking about? I can't remember his name, but he's he confronted the New York Times and sure. he introduces this discussion into transnational blackness and why Negro is um, is. Um, it's not a word you should be using or calling other people. So I, for the sake of our audience, I want you to expound a little bit on what Negro means sure. and how somebody from Africa might interpret it and somebody from America could understand it. So then we have like this uniform understanding of what it means. Because, you know, my father uses the word Negro because he grew up in the 60s. Sure. And he probably doesn't know that it is wrong, huh? Sure. Well, um, thank you for the question, uh, uh, Cliff. And um, I, I want to respond to Travis as well, um, being that you're in the AEDS program now and, um, uh, and that you're the president. I just want to give you 
all the power and blessings to continue in that role, sir. And to let you know that if you if you if you if you need anything or if you'd like to if you need someone to help, if you want need someone to talk to, I'm here. You can reach out to me. I've also been through that program. I've never met you before, but um, I just want to let you know that uh, Alabama uh, uh, was the central location uh, uh, that first captured uh, my interest in relation to Richard B. Moore, who I was talking about. Uh, as an immigrant from Barbados myself to the United States, once I found out that this uh, ancestor, right, this uh, this this Barbadian immigrant from a hundred years earlier in my life was in the middle of Alabama, in the middle of Jim Crow. That blew my mind, right? And that he was uh, uh, almost the bodyguard of the Scottsboro Mothers. That fact alone was my inspiration into pursuing historical. I need I needed to answer this question: How did this immigrant from Barbados find himself in the middle of the Black Belt during the, the during the social nadir of the United States? So, you know, when you said you had a PhD in white supremacy, I was like, I'm sure that brother does coming out of Alabama. Yeah, because my, my thing is, I'm Kari, and I would love to keep in contact with you, but yeah. it's funny that you said um, of Bayesian ancestry, because I, my grandmother told me her great grandfather's from Barbados. So, so people, when people think of the South, they think, you know, just, you know, cut and dry black and white. It's very diverse down there. But racism, when people think about, you know, the Southern part of the United States, they think, um, oh, the South is racist. And I'm like, no, you mean the South that begin, that ends in Canada, that starts in Mexico. Okay. You mean all of that? Because Absolutely. I lived in Boston. I lived in Boston, and it was hella racist. I lived in Minnesota, it was hella racist. So I can detect anti-blackness everywhere. But with, anti-blackness um, is American as American pie, as, as apple pie. So Absolutely. So um, just, add, just not trying to hold it up, hold up other people who want to speak. But the thing is, I... Even my European friends, I had to tell them that I experienced anti-black racism outside the United States. Because my thing is, we it, it's, it's not a my issue no more, it's a their issue. So that's what brought me a lot of healing and it brought it, it melt down a lot of hostility that I had when I was confronted with it. And just hearing everybody's, you know, standpoint on what, you know, what blackness mean and the doctor from Lehi, I mean, Lehi, I mean, he just said some very tremendous that you know, slavery didn't start racism. Racism was a byproduct of slavery. Product of slavery. Absolutely. Because my thing is, and the thing that would anger me the most, Kari, is my hair. You know, black people in the state say, "Oh, we never had." And I'm like, we had our black towns. Allensworth. I just came from Allensworth in California, which was a black town founded by Buffalo, Buffalo soldiers. Mine's but by was, you. yes, but it was poison. Just and I said that was a precursor to what we're dealing with in Flint and Michigan. So my okay. thing is, we have the ability to, you know, transform and to grow within modernization and without losing our authenticity. But the world is afraid of that. Sure, sure. Well, thank, thank you, Travis. And in response to uh, 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 Dr. Cadero's question, um, yes, uh, the term Negro being an, a, a, a term originated uh, in uh, Spain or Portugal um, to identify um, those people who have been dispossessed of rights Right, that's where the term Negro finds its origin. Um, in Richard B. Moore's uh, text, the name Negro and its evil uh, and, its, and its evil usages, uh, he identifies the origin of the term, and then uh, in just eighty pages, this is a short book that's really um, oratory uh, compiled into print form. Uh, he then connects uh, the origin of the term to its application over time um, and its application as uh, um, an identification for subjects of enslavement, um, a transatlantic enslavement heading towards the new world, right? And as the British become more involved in the trade through the Royal African Company, etc., they adopt the terms of the trade and the term Negro then, uh, you know, becomes uh, a term that crosses over from its uh, Andal Andalusian or, you know, um, also Iberian origins to now uh, an Anglophone term, right? Um, we know that, you know, in, in, it's the word from Spanish to English means black, right? So uh, in the text and in his entire life, this is a, an immigrant from the Caribbean who uh, is um, essentially challenging the notion of, or, of what the term means uh, with every fiber in his being, 
Um, and so um, my research is constantly revisiting his example and uh, the activities that, uh, that were present in his lifetime of activism against racism as ultimately at the end, he focused in on it originating out of the term Negro itself. Does that address your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, um, I, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk um, about my own experience as, um, as a black man in Miami. Um, um, unlike most of the speakers uh, who came as older students, I came as an 11-year-old um, and moved to Miami um, in the mid-80s at a time when lots of other Latin American immigrants, such as myself, were coming in. And I mean, I, if I could tell you my experiences with racism in Miami, I'd be talking all day. So I don't know if we need, if you want me to do that or not, but uh, uh, it's been quite the rocky road, uh, like Burning Spear and those guys would, would, would say. It's been a rocky road, you know? So uh, I'll reflect on that if there's any interest in it, but I don't want to take any more time if there are other questions. Mm -hmm. Olivia, are you going to read? There's a question here sent by our uh, one of our uh, listeners. Oh, let me go ahead and read it. This is going to Dr. Asian. Uh, the writer says, it's Tom, and he says to Dr. Asian and others, where should we place the otherness? It exists to the lowest segmentation of people all over the world. The manifestation are obviously in the form of race, nationality, regionalism, tribalism, clanism, EDC. And uh, I have, have to go, but I'll listen to this when, when I return. So I want to, you want to know about otherness. So Dr. Asin, you can talk about it. We also have um, Dr. Chiakri Bienvenu and my good friend, uh, Illinois Temeluk, and they're all good. Thank us, and they, they are open to join in the discussion as well. So, um, uh, the question about otherness is it posted when you read it? You went too fast, I couldn't get Oh, Oh, yeah, it's posted in the chats. It's Which a one? question from Tom. From Tom? Yeah. Okay, so what time did he post it so that I can quickly jump on? Let's see. He, at 1 10 p.m. 1 10, okay. So, yeah. oh, I don't see 1 10 in mind. Anyway. Uh, oh, he sent it to me privately. Oh, he sent it to you privately. Okay, okay. I'm okay. sorry. Let, 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 me, let me send it to you. Let me send I heard it. something about, it, about otherness. Yeah, let me send it. Uh, uh, you're going to find it. Right, there we go. You got it now. Oh, no. No, you've not sent it. Oh, I sent it to somebody else. I'm not. If you send it to everyone, we'll get it. Just send it to everyone. Okay. We'll All right, good. Now everybody got it. I think you send it to me privately. The question. Yeah, now I've sent it to everybody. Everybody can see it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, if I understand your question, otherness before Europeans created the um, that category of blackness and whiteness, it was already existing in several societies. So whether you're talking about sexism you're talking about what people refer to as tribalism whatever word you want to use it any form of um, classification of people has existed in human society but i guess in the context of this discussion it was more about blackness that's why we focus on blackness but we should be very careful when we are answering questions about blackness because what happens is Sometimes when you want to talk about racism, somebody asks a question about racism, you want to answer it, and somebody say, well, in Africa, people are, you know, are, are, I mean, discriminate against others too. That's not what we are talking about. The question is about racism. So let's talk about that. And when we finish, we can talk about that. But it becomes a distraction sometimes. And it's a very nice way of trying to distract people or justify something that in its context might be different from what we are talking about. Right. So to answer your question, I will basically say um, it's existed historically. It's been in every society. And it's a very strategic way of marginalizing people, you know, like really marking them for some type of destruction or for some type, targeting them. Because you got to draw that line. If, if you can, if you look at Jim Crow laws in the South, they had to say, 
white only, black only. So that's a, a, a very simplified way to draw lines between people, whether it's sexism or whether it's whatever way you want to take it. It's always a very strategic way. Of, so we are, we are not going to say white people created otherness. It's, it's existed in every society throughout history. But right now we're just talking about otherness relative to race because it's probably the most impactful yes, yes, in yes, human yes, 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 yes. So otherness relative to race is what I discussed. It's just basically what is constructed to justify, all right? So if you, if you create the otherness, it gives you a reason. Oh, these people are not superior. These people don't do this. People, these people don't do that. They went to Africa. They said Africans don't have a religion. All right. The Africans are savages. The Africans are heathens. The Africans don't have a civilization. But these same people were walking around other places in Africa where there were civilizations. So to justify it, you have to say, one, the person is not a Christian. Two, the person is not like us. So you other them. You, you break them in pieces. You, they become the other people who are inferior to us. So you're looking for different strategic way of placing them in a position so that you don't look bad. If you say they don't have a civilization, you got to find something else to justify. Right? They come out and say, well, what about it? Um, the, the Sphinx and the pyramids? You're like, okay, we are not talking about, maybe we are talking about religion. Okay, religion, they worship idols. You know, it goes on and on. It goes on and says, it's a very strategic way of doing that. Anybody can chip in here. I mean, I guess it's a good question. But doctor, um, I, I agree with you there. Um, I don't think that one thing I will say is um, I don't think nobody was saying that, you know, with racism, the oven is, you know, it started with white people. It's the fact that this is so engineered and so sophisticated and getting more sophisticated over time because the, the power structure is being fed by us. You know, we think that, you know, we're working certain system that we're liberating, you know, people. But at the same time, we're feeding the system that oppress, you know, people that look like us throughout, you know, the diaspora, not just the United States as a whole. And... Mm -hmm. And you're right, racism is um, everywhere because just recently, and my, I have a background in um, international relations, and I did not know that Black Mauritanians were getting killed by Arab Mauritanians, and there's a lot of stuff that, you know, that is very robust on the continent of Africa. It's only been to one country, and I'm going to go to more in the future, but I would say um, anti-Black racism, which, you know, we're talking about is, I've been to over 40 countries in the world. And I did the first Kwanzaa event in Buenos Aires, Argentina with the Afro-Argentine people. And I would say Argentina in this Western world was the only country that practiced successfully, almost successfully practiced eugenics, where they decimated the black mm. population down to 1% to where it is today. And just going there and they put black people back on the registry in 2010 and black people have been fighting for years, you know, to say, look, I'm here. And just, you know, the, go down there and touch them on the, um, you know, in Argentina. It shows how um, global and transnational anti-black racism is and how dangerous and insidious it still is. Yep, that makes sense. And I think somebody has a question about performing blackness. I don't know if you want me to answer that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So quickly, I'm going to say this. So Actually, that was a I, quote, I, I did that okay. and I just quoted when I put that in the chat, I quoted you as a quote because I'm gonna use that. Oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. All right. Okay. So, Jeffrey, you got a comment? All right. So, I mean. So, go ahead, Dr. Asian. Then, Fiacre is gonna come in. Uh. Well, I mean, basically, um, it's a game. You know, you have to have the the other part. What the other thing you want to look at is that higher education. I think we lost him. I think so. Yeah. Go ahead, Fiakri. Uh, thank you very much. There's really not much to say here. Um, oh. Is somebody talking? Do we have a Okay, go ahead, Dr. Isien. So I'm just saying, so for example, McDonald's knows they cannot hire only white people. Burger King knows they can't hire only white people. Walmart knows, Kmart knows, all these stores knows that, all right? It's become, you have to have some blackness or some diversity in your quotas. Parents are looking for places, parents are becoming more sophisticated, looking for places to take their children to school where there'll be some type of diversity. And people can just check on your website, your school's website yeah. to see wherever you have. Numbers might not help you out. And the state government, the federal government, 
gives money, taxpayers' money, which is paid by both black and white people and brown people. So schools, federal government requires that you meet some quota. You can't just take federal government money and not show that you have faculty of color or you have um, um, students' body that is diversified. So performing blackness is important for all these institutions. They might not care about you, but as long as you give me the job, I care less. I'm qualified, I'm there. Whatever reason why you hide me, I know I have a PhD. It wasn't given to me because I'm from Africa. I work for it and I'm still paying the student's loan on it. So if you bring me there, somebody might say, well, they brought you there because of diversity, because of affirmative action. You can say whatever you want to say. I know I did my qualifying exams and I got a PhD and I got this job. That's all I know. Yeah. Knight got a question and then we're going to go to Fiacre. Yeah. Eliani. Eliani. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Sorry for the lead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ileoni Telemak. I am an FIU guy. I, heard, I earn uh, four degrees there. One in a bachelor's, a bachelor's in international relations to uh, a minor in economics to master's one in global governance and the other one in African and African diaspora studies. I, uh, if I get it right, um, uh, historian Kerry in, in his presentation mentioned uh, mention the terms of uh, diacon, diacon, diaconic and synchronic. I, uh, I would like to ask historian Kerry, in what sense can one state that the, the middle passage, the stage of uh, tri triangular trade is more synchronic than diachronic? <laughs> All right, thank you for the question, uh, Elioni. And long time, I haven't seen you in a while, so greetings to you, brother. Good to see you. Well, uh, as you know, you know, Orlando Patterson's uh, theory of social death, right? That uh, the Middle Passage represented uh, this abandonment of everything that was known before, right? And then we have the routes from Paul Gilroy about uh, blackness. Uh, sprouting from the routes, not the roots, not, not essential to Africa, right? So blackness um, as a form of othering projected upon these peoples, right? Uh, some of whom originated from the African continent or most of whom originated from the African continent mixed in with people who originated in the Native American continent, right? Mixed in with European people, right? Many so-called black people have ancestry that goes all over the world to all of these different supposed places, right? We know that race is a social construct, right? So um, blackness as a category itself, uh, uh, therefore, is a place that has no one singular root. So essentially, uh, Dr. Rahir's formulation of synchronic, synchronicity, right? We are, all, we are essentially then synchronistic beings, in a sense, in that we are not essentialized to nation states which are temporal or particular dots on the map, which may account for an ancestor or two, but can never define the wholeness of who we are, right? Um, in terms of blackness as an idea, or as an ideal, uh, something uh, essentially non-physical. We have then multiple sources of blackness. Blackness may express itself and evolve differently from Miami than it is uh, sprouting and evolving from New York or from London. Uh, today, I'm, I remain fascinated with the uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Joy White's uh, explanation of or, or ex uh, exploration of. Uh, of blackness performed through uh, musical expression as a form of, realize, of realizing uh, uh, blackness 
in London, uh, multicultural London, which uh, uh, brings uh, within it uh, black, black views from the Caribbean, black views from West Africa in particular, uh, uh, in, uh, through the storyboard or the vernacular language of rap uh, originated in New York from a, a multiple, multiple vectors of blackness. So we see uh, uh, a blackness that is constantly uh, evolving and finding itself and defining itself uh, over and over. And, 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 and that to me uh, uh, can only be described through the uh, description, descriptive word as a synchronic uh, nature of blackness. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I want, I have actually a point you know, that builds off of the last comment um, that Carrie mentioned. So considering you know, the discussion today more or less really um, gives a, a good look into the struggles associated with being black, whether you're in Africa, uh, in the Caribbean or continental America, you know, north and south. And we have, as we have seen, blackness is uh, a multitude of segments. There are an, uh, an infinite variety of entities that make up this umbrella unit that we call blackness. Um, and it's not that we are a monolithic category. No, we're not we actually realize that we have even um, differences and um, diverging views on self-identification. You know, how we, you know, th there's no, what you would call really a social contract as far as you know, self-recognition goes or um, self-identification. So we are diverse. You now we have heard testimonies you know, when, an African from Rwanda or Kenya or Malawi gets in America and you encounter with your fellow black Americans, my, you know, maybe it's really to stretch on my, my point. I'm avoiding to be, to be too long to make a point. But when I came to America 10 years ago, I so wanted to be able to understand black Americans. I wanted to be able to go to church with them, make friends, be invited over at a black party, understand what it meant to be black, the struggles associated with being black. And I had thought that this was natural. You know, by virtue of being born in same color of skin, that this encounter would be easy. But to my surprise and to my um, disappointment rather, it wasn't as easy as I thought. So my friend and you know, I was in the same class, you no know, seminar, graduate seminar. I told him, Don, you know, we should go for coffee. And so off we went one time and I told him first thing, you know, discussion, um, as I was really weaving you know, this question, trying to tie this bond, you know, trans you know, regional as regional. So he's based, he's off from here. I'm an implant from somewhere else, but we're nonetheless forced to operate on the same um, territory. And so I asked him, so Don, what is it for you like to be in this seminar with being, you know, with me being the only two black people in, um, in this class, everybody else comes from the Middle East and, and Latin America and also Europe and here in America. So what is it for you like to be the only African-American in this classroom? And right there, he stopped me. He said, uh, first of all, Fiacra, you know, don't call me African-American because I'm not. Uh, you, Fiacre, when you become a citizen, when you become a citizen of America, you are the one who will be African-American. Just, and you know, really made sense. I was uh, looking like a, you know, 
yeah, so I really listened. I was more into to be lectured and to be educated. You know, this was more complicated than I thought. You know, so he presses even a more reasoned point. He says, just as we don't say European American, Oh yeah, I have that book, brother. <laughs> uh, oh, I didn't so, mean to distract. Sorry. <laughs> so this encounter is really interesting dynamic. You know, it says, just as we don't say European American, why should we say African American? I don't have any cousins in Africa. We don't own any land in Africa. I can't just pack off, take on a plane and go somewhere in Africa. I don't where, I don't even know where I would begin to go. And so if you want to call me anything in reference to the color of my skin, call me Black American. And right there, it shattered and it shot everything I had come with all the enthusiasm and all the excitement just kind of were held down. And I said, oh, 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 oh okay, I got to be careful. So right there, I understood that you know, although we think that being black, and you can go back to the times of slavery, colonialism, and also post-colonialism, that being black is always associated with the struggle that we all share. And racism applies on us with no distinctions, but within us as an intra-category struggle or dynamics, there is not one you can say that bind us in a, in a cross regional bond that you would say automatically happens because we're both black. And so, and then we can go back, you know, the time of you now four thinkers and you know, forefathers uh, who've really put time into thinking about this problem associated with being black. You know, the W.B. Du Bois, you know, his movement, Pan-Africanist, you know, support, his support of Pan-Africanism, but also, um, you know, you know, the times of Haile Selassie when he comes to America, many kings, you know, the dismantling of kingdoms in Africa, they all came to America as a way of claiming, beginning the movement and gave us independence in Africa. So you would think that this bond would just continue, but it does not. And there's actually stereotypes. So we've talked about this with my friend Uba, when uh, you have, you know, so what do they think about us? You know, African, uh, black Americans, not African Americans, black Americans, what do they think of Africans? Like most of you, like me, who come to America, or when they go to Africa, what do they think? Well, stereotypes hold it that they think we're brainwashed, you know, don't have a kind of grounded sense of self. We are just um, you know, a bunch of us who were colonized and you know, who look at the Europeans as, oh, we've seen the God and you know, tend to glorify whatever comes from outside the continent as if there's no one grounded system of thought that is indigenous to our own. And so when we come to America, they think that there is no one who represents better the black, global blackness and this, as a, a global entity with a culturally defined, precise sense of identity than the black Americans. So we have nothing to teach to our fellow black Americans here as far as who counts for what, what is to be black. So we may well think, you know, we share the history of, you know, uh, subjugation, slavery, colonialism, and racism everywhere. But in terms of unifying these, you know, set multiple segments that make us all, all up together, so this global blackness, not just as, you know, one category, one umbrella where we think we're all the same, but at least to use that as a strategy of resistance. That is really a big problem. So finally, to come down to my question, and I would like really to, to address it straight, you know, directly to Carrie, maybe to help us really you know, think about you know, what ways can, we can think of 
you know, blackness as maybe we can put aside whatever divides us, whatever separates us. But is there a way and what is the way we can say blackness can be utilized as a strategy for resisting the oppression when we talk of you know, any practical matter, whether it's police brutality everywhere you go, whether it's socioeconomic inequity that just characterizes us everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, you have you know, Brazil, the second largest nation after, and the first largest nation and after Africa with the black population. So how do you really use this thing we study that we really are immersed into, but that we haven't been able to utilize as a way of achieving the actual social change. How do you use that? And you know, what have people who have come before us missed as one way that can really propel us to you know, victory or winning over the you know, forms of oppression we've always faced across the world? I'm gonna let in I'm going to let in uh, Ocheng Oginga, who is a college student, but we're going to hold on to that question and, you know, learned friends, some of you are going to respond to that and anybody is welcome to respond to it. Good point, Fiacre. Just shattered my brain. <laughs> Ocheng, huh? Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, so my name is uh, Ocheng Oginga. I'm an undergrad uh, student in a small city in Kentucky. <laughs> I'm doing economics and uh, agriculture. So actually, I think Friakra was reading my mind because um, also when I was coming here to the States, um, one of the things that I was thinking was kind of to build or make African-American friends, uh, build that kind of relationship. But then when I came to Berea, uh, it was kind of challenging because there was a disconnect between Africans and African-Americans. And the disconnect became even larger because we have African Students Association and Black Student Union. So you find like African students will go to African Students Association, Black students will go to, not Black students, African Americans will go to uh, BSU. And oftentimes you'll find people like me, we have membership in both of them. But if I go to BSU, you will find I'm the only African or some, maybe two of us. Then if you go to ASA, you'll find maybe one or two African-Americans. So that disconnect is a, is a reality that um, right now, as a, even the president of African Students Association, we are struggling to bridge it, you know. Uh, so then that takes me to the next question, which is uh, we already highlighted uh, the problem that we have a common story. You don't face racism before you come to America. You land in the United States and you realize First, you're not your tribe, because you know when you're back in most African countries, you identify by your tribe or the region you come from. Then when leaving the airport, you think, well, I'm going to identify as a Kenyan. Then you realize once you land in Europe or the Americas, they don't identify you as your country or your tribe. You identify as black. And you're like, you know, at which point did I start identifying as something that I have never known my entire life? Now. I wanted to ask this question because that's a problem, the identity and uh, the racism that is attached to it. However, it's interesting to see that most Asian tigers, uh, like even China, they have kind of, we were at the same level with them in uh, the 1960s. We can even say that most American anti-immigration laws were directed towards Japanese, Indians and Chinese. That goes all the way to uh, between 18, 1860s, then it comes all the way to 19 something, and then they, make, they made a lot of acts that was kind of trying to reduce Asian migration to the United States. And also there was continued specific um, discrimination against Asian during that time. However, the story is different today. Uh, these people kind of moved um, I would think in my school, there's no one from Singapore, <laughs> you know, why, why is it that there's no one from Singapore? Most people in my school who are internationals tend to come from countries that are not doing well uh, economically. So kind of, I'm trying to ask, what do you think is the place of uh, science, technology, research, development and economic growth in kind of uh, reducing the uh, 
the racism that is directed towards Africans, because I think most of these countries like Arab countries, even China, when they go to the negotiating table today, they have leverage. While most African countries, we were the same with them in the 1960s. Kenya gave um, uh, foreign aid to um, Malaysia around $6 million in 1966. We were giving foreign aid in 1966. Can we even like, can we even buy them a cup of tea today? You know, so like right now, Malaysia has kind of a negotiating power if they go to the global level because they improved in terms of science and research, um, technology and economic growth. What place do you think that can play in the uplifting of the African people and black people to bring them to a level of uh, negotiations where we don't always have to look up, we can be on the same level of conversation? Thank you. Good question. I, I wanted to add that before we open it up so we can combine the three questions. I just wanted to get to Odinga uh, about one thing is that there's always this sentiment that blackness is an elite discourse, that we sitting out here talking about it as mostly college graduates and uh, higher graduate degrees does not permeate to the basic level of understanding of the common facts. So then it becomes the issue of nationalism. Like this people on Facebook talk about skin folk is not kin folk. So we can share skin blackness, but we might not be kins because we might not be operating in the same dynamics in the same economically. So if let's say, for example, Donald Trump is anti-immigration and to somebody who probably is not college educated, probably lost his jo uh, manufacturing job in Ohio, that is a silver lining. It might be absurd. It might be purely nonsensical to you. But we also ha I have to understand it in this uh, lenses. So how then do we move the conversation from being an elite discourse to one that is more generalized and then go back to what Fiatri was talking about, solving problems using black, you know, understanding of uh, global blackness. Okay, I, I, I will jump in here. Um, being that uh, Dr. Bienvenu, uh, directed um, one of those questions to me specifically. Um, um, and in response to his uh, question, as well as the direction that the panel has taken, um, I think it's important that um, we take heed with the advice that you just gave us, uh, Dr. Cadero, in, uh, in remembering our, our, our perhaps a station or elite station as higher degree graduates who have the time and space to investigate our lineage, our histories, our connected stories. Um, whereas when we face the kinds of interactions that Dr. Ben Bienvenu uh, uh, shared with us, oftentimes, unfortunately, we're not speaking to our uh, African-American um, uh, counterparts uh, from a place of uh, equal level of sense of self. Uh, one of the things we forget often is uh, the extreme, uh, uh, the extreme uh, uh, system of isolation that, that African-Americans have generally been through in terms of not knowing who they are, not knowing who we are as an African-American people. Coming up through the K through 12 systems here in the United States of America, there is not the sense of self that growing up in an African country or even a Caribbean country uh, gives a black person in terms of, uh, of knowing your nationality, knowing your tribe, um, knowing who you are at some, in, in some sense. Uh, what fills in that void is this objectification as a black person which has then been advised through centuries of what? Exploitation, degradation, uh, criminalization uh, that is projected onto blackness. So the perspective of an African-American then um, as a black person is completely different than a person like myself coming from Barbados and seeing blackness expressed through the West Indian cricket team as it dominated England in my childhood, right? Or uh, 
or through the lyrics of a Bob Marley uh, or a knowledge of a Marcus Garvey. So in some senses, I think um, uh, uh, we've got to keep in mind um, that, uh, for instance, when, when, when the person uh, responded to you, Dr. Bienvenu, and said, well, I, I, have, I, have an, I, I don't have cousins, I don't have land, I don't know where to look, uh, in relation to uh, his roots in Africa, explaining why he could not, he or she could not become an African American. Um, I think a response to that person would have been, "Well, have you looked? Have you? How much time have you spent uh, investigating your your roots, your ancestors? Perhaps uh, if you take a step, you might be surprised at what you can find. Uh, in particular, as newer uh, genealogy, genealogical research." techniques as, as, as more records make themselves available. And even, I know we don't like to rely on um, our genetic testing or DNA studies as well, but I think they may even play a role here in identifying where uh, certain uh, 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 groups of your genetics uh, are, are strongly based in on the West African continent. Um, so increasingly, I think uh, for people who might argue uh, that there are Black Americans and not African Americans, I, I, I think that uh, uh, I think that that argument is 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 going to become less uh, 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 less strong and become a bit more tenuous uh, as we move into the future, as genealogical researches increase, as histories are written, and even as um, DNA studies uh, provide uh, linkages to a, a recovery of perhaps an identity of some, at least, of the ancestors who are at least most commonly uh, are grouped as black, for instance. Okay, so, and I'll stop there. Okay, we got about eight minutes. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a friend of mine, Sharice, are you in? Um, Sharice, oh, she probably- Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I, I want you to get in here. I want you to get in here because I know this is your territory. I'm shy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes, um, I heard the gentleman there just speak about um, the DNA studies. I was born here in the U.S. in a little town named St. Louis, Missouri. But um, I know we had, you know, conversations about racism and so many things. That was something that I experienced early on, maybe at the age of five. That was my first time that I had an experience with racism when I, when I was called the N-word. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. It wasn't something that we used in my home, but I was in elementary school and someone called me that and I just knew that it wasn't a good word, you know? But um, long story short, if I were to go into the, the racial dynamic and even present day, forms of um, segregation in, in St. Louis, we'll sit here and talk till next year. So I'm not going to do that. But what, but all of that to say, um, from my personal experience, it's always made me want to want, want it, it, it's all made, it's always made me want to know who I am, you know, as a Black woman here in America. I always knew that my family was from St. Louis. Um, I heard that we had ancestors from the South and other places, but I wasn't able to really pinpoint exactly where um, my people were from. So more recently, maybe within what, I started updating you over about like a year ago, something yeah, like you started, that. You've been working on this for a year and a half now. Yeah, about a year and a half. I started, um, I took one of the last stories that I was told by my eldest grandma my eldest auntie yeah she passed on maybe three years ago but i recorded the family history so i listened to the family history and i started um an account with ancestry you know be it as it may but from there i was able to pull a lot of records and i was able to find out a lot about my family more recently i took a um a DNA test with African and African, no, it's, it's AfricanAncestry.com, something like that. And I was able to um, find out that I have ancestors who were um, from Nigeria in the Igbo tribe. So 
you know it 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 really is, it really warms my heart because now i feel like i can connect with my past and i no longer have to say well i'm only african american or i'm from here and i don't know where my roots are so that's to say if someone really wants to find out you can because there are resources out there can i make a comment right quick before let's go ahead yeah, so um, thanks for sharing. Um, is your name is Sherry. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. this um, very emotional and um, very vibrant story. I guess it's warmed your heart when you realize you finally found a place. Yes. I, I write about the stories, the history of reverse migration. I mean, basically mm -hmm. looking at people of African descent that are seeking to reconnect to Africa. I, my, my master's thesis was about African Americans. Who live in Ghana, and then my 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 PhD was on the, the history of free slaves, enslaved Africans from Brazil that returned to Ghana, West Africa. So there were people that were able to identify to Ghana, uh, specifically to Ghana, because their ancestors they believe they came from that location. So I can relate to what you just said. But one thing I wanted to quickly throw out there is to just help us to also remember that there is this mutual ignorance on the yeah. side. Africans oh, yeah. and of African Americans. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has to do with history. It has to do with some mm -hmm. of the things we talked about early. The efforts to try to create the other people. The, the, the Europeans were so smart, they created the African on the continent mm -hmm. and they created the other black person on the, um, uh, on the North American um, continent mm -hmm. to try to divide these two same group of people. All right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just think about it this way. Look at what was done to George Floyd. Brianna Taylor, any of these people that have been slaughtered like animals. Mm -hmm. If you trace the ancestry, they come from somewhere on the African continent. Mm -hmm. And as Sherry said, she's located in Nigeria. Several people have told their story. The point I'm making here is we as Africans in particular, and I'm, I'm speaking to Africans, mm -hmm. we are all people of African descent, but I'm specifically addressing Africans. We come here and then we get that surprise. I think this brother, Fiasi, Fiacri explained how surprised it was when he was excited about meeting an African American. I had the same awakening in California when I arrived. I thought, wow, they will just accept me because I'm, I'm from Ghana or Africa. It doesn't work like that. So we should also think about how history has been distorted for so long and how white people have found ways to divide us. And we are not blaming white people for everything. We have a responsibility to bridge mm -hmm. the gap, all right? We can't blame them for everything. But mm -hmm. we should remember people like W.E.B. Du Bois. If you mm -hmm. read the biography or the autobiography of um, um, Du Bois, Du Bois at a point bought into this notion that Africans were inferior to him. You get it? He felt like he was better than Africans because he's Black American. Mm -hmm. Think about the, um, was, uh, Marcus Garvey, the same problem. Garvey at a point said all Africans, all Europeans should leave Africa. Let's take over Africa. I mean, the UNIA, part of what he was trying to do was to take over Africa. But read closely. Gave said he was so civilized than any African and he wanted to take over Africa. So you see this, this mutual ignorance mm -hmm. coming up in different ways, whether it's the Pan-African leaders or whoever they are. We, the generation of ours, we should be extremely careful and sensitive when we are dealing with African-Americans in the U.S. Because several of them, I mean, I don't want to repeat myself, but they also have this limited knowledge of who we are because of perhaps things that they've internalized. So it takes a lot of patience to bridge the gap, all right? And for Africans, please stop using the word akata. They know what I'm talking about. The word akata, we use it to describe African-Americans. And it's, in a way, dehumanizes them. It makes them look as the other. Bro, and sisters, let's stop that. We need to start with ourselves to stop using some of these words that those who are not in our category, category in the sense of being in the education system or learning about these things, not, you know, we don't want to repeat those mistakes. So I'm only pointing out this quickly before we leave that we have a responsibility on each side of the continent to do our best to re-educate, to teach, to continuously share and tell and be sensitive to towards each other when it comes to the subject. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I want to let in Duncan, if he's still in, to talk, to respond to Oginga on the question of economy and race and how race can be unraised <laughs> based on economic power. Oginga, are you there? I mean, uh, Duncan, are you there? 
Um, anybody who can give him a quick answer on that and how you know economic growth can deracialize some of these tensions that exist because of a uh, you know history. So, uh, Professor Asian, you can get the last word and then we close it up. On you this one, on this question. Yeah, on this question. <laughs> well, I mean, I think economic um, everything that we've talked about, especially the last one, issues with economic inequality and its ties to race has something to do with most of the things that we've talked about. It is put in place, racial inequality is tied to economic inequality. If you just think about the time of slavery, it was set up that way to continuously keep one group of people on the other side. If you look at, I don't know how many of you have um, um, watched videos about the, the Tulsa riots, riots in the early 1900s. Look, there are things coming up during this lockdown that I didn't know. All right, including how black people, you take your time and look at the history of the United States from the time slavery ended in the 1860s, whatever time you want to pick up, the time that Jim Crow laws were set up, the, the times that, you know, they had, um, um, uh, how do you call it, um, sharecropping. And you, you, it's a timeline. Throughout all these different historical moments, the goal has always been to make sure that black people don't have the economic freedom. Because economic freedom will allow you to live in a rich neighborhood and they don't want you there, all right? So they have all this system put in place, but the Tulsa riot, I think everybody should watch it when you leave this platform. It's unbelievable how a group of black people, even after all that was done to the ancestors, they were able to build a huge black economy in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and go read for yourself what white people did to them. They destroyed everything. All right, they, they, they used to call it the black, um, how do you call it, the Wall Street. Is it Wall Street? Black Wall Street? But, but yeah. this is important because it helps us understand that somebody has to be a slave. For many people, slavery has still not ended. So there are several white people that believe that we should have that system in place. They don't have to have it the way it was like 200 years ago. But the economic inequalities, the whole goal is to make sure that white privilege is protected. And as I stated earlier, I told um, students in my class that if you think you, don't, you are not benefiting from white privilege, go do your DNA test. Maybe your DNA test will lead you to somewhere in Europe and you're gonna find out that maybe your grand grandparents were indentured servants that came to the United States. And after seven, whatever time they had, they gave them free land and maybe your parents are inheriting some of those lands. So again, it's it's all linked in different ways to it. I mean, I'm throwing so many things out there, but the whole idea is that the whole, there is no, it seems like, it seems to me, I want to be very positive, but it seems to me like slavery, sorry, racism, racial inequality, economic inequality is not meant to end. If it ends, some people will lose their, lose their privilege. And because they don't want you, just listen to what Trump said, all right? Trump said, um, um, how do you call it? Uh, he said he was addressing white women in the suburban area. He said, I saved you. I helped you to stop those people from coming to live with you. Because those black folks, if they come to your community, they're not going to cut their grass. They're going to play loud music and they're going to destroy your neighborhood. So your, your property will be, will be devalued. So it's, everything is linked. It's tied up to politics, to science, to whatever you want to talk about it. And it's actually to religion. You all should be very careful. Religion plays a huge role in perpetuating what we are talking about now. Thank you, guys. That's all the time we got. I mean, this could go on for the whole day, but we were, we're going to organize another one in about two months, and we will request you guys to be available for it, and we can continue this discussion. So thank you guys all for coming up. I'm really impressed. Learned quite a bit, and I'm really elated. Thank you, guys, and have a good weekend. Well, thanks for inviting thank us. You. Uh, thank you. Bye, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you right. for organizing this. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. So you can continue to leave. If you want to stay a little longer, that's okay. But it's meeting is technically over. <laughs> yeah, okay. So how do you expect us to leave now? Are you <laughs> you can wait. <laughs> we can leave. I, I'm going to hang out and tell you tomorrow. Edit. But Oginga, uh -huh. um, since the people I see here, we can talk about See, the global political economy, this, this world's in theory, I know Fiacre will know this, that the, the world is a system. I talked about it in one of the shows that I made. Mm -hmm. So at the time you're talking in the 60s, the, the world had just gotten out of a war, 1945, right? So this new in the global political economy has been set up 
But Europe was still disadvantaged at the time because uh, 15 years is a short time to recover your manufacturing power. So because Europe was figuring out things, Africa was good because it was producing many of those things required to re-industrialize Europe, you understand? So mm -hmm. countries like um, Ghana were pretty much middle income economies in the 60s, same for like uh, slightly stable African countries, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, even Malawi, you can't believe that. And uh, they were thriving. So that's why they could sell coffee, they could, you know, they sell a mineral product that were required at a much more higher global price. Now ca come to the 70s, Europe is recovering, right? And Europe is going through uh, increasing manufacturing while African products are reducing in price. So co copper prices collapse in the global market. Zambia goes down. Ghana, coffee, co co cocoa prices drop, goes down. Kenya is struggling with coffee. And uh, the era of authoritarian regimes is coming in the 70s in Africa. So as Europe is rising and Asia is rising, Africa is going down. So what I'm trying to tell you is that there is, you have to follow the global history. You have to follow what is the press of Africa. What is, you, and you have to connect it with race as well. You connect these two, if you carry, you sent me an article about two weeks ago about this Jamaican guy who was writing. You remember what I'm talking about? I can't remember his name. But he tells this story. I'll find it and send it to you. If you isolate them, then you, you isolate them independently. Just think about it. Oh, Ghana was rich in the 60s and Malaysia wasn't. Why is that? That's too simplistic. Look at the system, how it moves. Mm -hmm. Then you will understand it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, just, I just wanted to, you know, uh, yeah. I understand the role of the global economy. Yeah. But, uh, you also have to uh, uh, like understand that one of the things that makes a country succeed or even a business is agility, ability to adjust to dynamics, you understand? So I don't think it's fair to blame the global economy for our inability to adapt to new challenges. Because while we were mostly producers of raw materials, we would have realized by the time that we had this time and say, okay, we have been sending coffee to Germany for processing, right? We still do send coffee right now. It's not like we have changed over 60 years. So if we switch our economy from just producing raw materials, which we did all the way to transatlantic trade to where we add value to our products, then that would, you know, that's what uh, most countries have grown on. If you look at, uh, uh, I would say countries like Costa Rica, right? Uh, they're, they're not just set, selling coffee to the United States anymore they are selling coffee that already has been processed. So they're not just selling the, the, the beans that has low economic value. They're selling the complete coffee. So, and they're doing well, <laughs> you know. So most African countries, uh, we, we can say that our, in, the inability of our industries to kind of spring up and add that value to what we have, have also like kind of played a role in uh, our diminishing return on, on our economics. Yeah, I agree. Right. I'm going to answer you real quick, then I'm going to let somebody go in. Okay. So if, <laughs> these days I get really frustrated, and I don't want to be, because, you know, African state and Caribbean state and Latin America and some Asian countries have always done what they have been told to do, almost word by word, by these experts telling them what, how to develop. And the result is always not what they expect. They tell, oh, maybe you should do this. Oh, maybe you should do this. It is under. So there was this time they started what we call import substitution industries. I'm not excusing the dictators who chop people's hands and stuff. I'm just saying, economically speaking, there is a problem in the way this economic system is organized and it limits how much we can rise as a people. Because we tend to populate places that are not in the mainstream of economic development. We can rise marginally, like South Africa is doing. Even that has a limit to it, too. Somebody else can talk. I think I've said enough. <laughs> huh? No, I thought, I thought, uh, you know, 
uh, Oginga actually, you know, a non sequitur point related to your name. I wondered whether if you remove that first G and it would become, you, you become a politician lineage and you know, some kind of ascend <laughs> descendant. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my father was born around the same time that, that Jaramogi Oginga Odinga was the vice president of Kenya. So he took the name Oginga and then so since I'm his son, I'm Ocheng Oginga. But we are not relatives. <laughs> Right, but you've been selling coffee since the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think your question was, because it, you know, it's aside from being a purely you know, complicated economic debate here, mm -hmm. there's also an element of race you attach to it. So technology, um, science, um, you know, really systematization or mechanization of the ways in which we, our production system has always functioned. If that improve, level of improvement can help us deal with racism in an international system. I think that's a you know, really interesting question. In a way, you know, you can not say that under development, really a term I don't like, of Africa, is outside you know, the racial consideration, just the, the subjugation that has always been um, subjected to African states as inherently inferior states you know, from the beginning of our encounter with the rest of the world as non-essential production entities. You know, we are there to represent some, you know, we are a source, a, a rich, spring well of raw materials that the world needs. But aside from that, there's nothing else really to learn. There's no one way or we have articulated our own values in such a way that places are at the same level of, I don't know, playing level uh, field of in the international trade system. So in such a way, we are equal interlocutors or co exchangers with the international system and and so and that the inherent inequality in the ways we, in which we are treated in the international system has to do with being black nations or uh, nations that have not been able to progress themselves for a long time so if we are able to make these economic inroads and headways that we equip ourselves with equally comp competitive technological advances, can that leverage our position in the ways in which we deal with the world? I think so, you know, but, you know, we haven't had really leaders of our own, and I agree with you, we shouldn't blame everything on the, the international structures of really that regulates the ways in which dealing, these de dealings occur. Um, I think the fault is ours primarily, and I think we have had leaders for a long time who have not really thought of the problem as such, as somehow that we need to empower ourselves and be able to establish ourselves as a robust, thought system that can equally compete that of European because we still represent nonetheless as you know for pessimism is still a prevalent term that is used to refer to what comes from Africa you know it's a paradise um, for pessimists anything you you want to go that's not working go to Africa famine diseases you know, that's where everything worse belongs. You know, that's really where to go. And I think that image and the imagery is not inconsequential. It is something huge in the ways in which we are perceived in any, you know, the value of our word in these negotiations and the way we bargain and huggle and establish our positions. And we can actually dictate our own terms. And that's really important. But so how do we construct a robust system in which there is you no know, this economic, this technological and science-based 
miracles that we can stand on and say, hey, from now on, we are, uh, we're no longer going to accept you to, to sell you our coffee in, in unprocessed coffee. We want to add value to anything we produce. And again, it just, this is just a coffee because it also has a history of dating back at the time where it was an imposition from, by Europeans to concentrate on primary commodities, which really uh, didn't build our economy on one system, or, which is an extractive system. We did not really see other ways to diversify multiple sectors of that build the economy. So, you know, there is really you know, an equal relations from the beginning, from the ways in which you know, the, foundations, the foundations of our economic systems were laid, that is racist. So what do we do? It, it's a very messy, complicated task, but we have to, it has to begin from uh, building a you know, robust education system you know, people like us, we come here and we, the things that we see when we learn, you know, you walk around and you watch, you know, how people operate, you know, economic actors work. You say, wow, you know, we don't have this. So they went to college, they had a degree, and then they built this, you know, business system. Families, you know, dating back 150 years, you know, they sustained it. It's hard to dismantle, to remove. Where do you see that kind of business culture in going in Africa? There's nowhere. So, and it begins from the school. So we can begin building our education systems where ideas, messy, complicated ideas are tested and explored and funded. The government pays attention and funds those, those ideas. And then, you know, it becomes a system. It sustains itself through our education system. But we don't have that. So it will take really long, you know, many decades to, to be able to compete with the, with the world. But we do have a major task to, you know, in really the problem is us, you know, fundamentally. You know, in my African politics class, we deal with this question the entire semester. And we ended with no answer. You know, why are structures of the government you know, weaker in Africa than anywhere else in the world? Yeah. And by weaker structures of the government, you know, this notion we call lack of development, and not just economic development, but also political development. Why? And we go into the debates going back in you know, slavery, colonialism, the effects of all those moments in the history of Africa, and post-colonial corruption, all these things, but you don't get the answer. They don't give you a satisfying answer as to why we haven't been able to achieve that. So really, you know, it's, it's an internal problem and we ask, so is the problem cultural or it's structural? Okay. Is the problem so internal or external? No, I think the problem is more internal than it is external, at least you know, moving forward and finding solutions. Go okay. ahead. And okay, so uh, my name is Robin. Uh, I'm a graduate uh, of Bachelor of Science in Information Technology. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to add on uh, what uh, Bian Nuva, I think yeah, I'm, I'm cool. pronouncing it right. Um, uh, I want to add on there. Uh, uh, I want to contradict. Actually, uh, the problem is external. I, I said uh, I, I sent a message that uh, we don't learn our history. We are taught our history. So it goes back to the food chain. Uh, you can actually create a food chain and put yourself at the bottom of the food chain. So it goes to they created the food chain, so they have to be at the top of the food chain. So, uh, if we want, if 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 you, you are, it's it's like, uh, let's say uh, you have your house and you invest, you invite guests at your house, and uh, you sleep outside. You can sleep outside. You sleep at the master bedroom. You have so you can put the guest in the master bedroom. So they created the system, and the system works the way they want it to work, not the way we want it to work. So actually what, what we are speaking here, 
uh, 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 the system uh, uh, that, that they have in place, they have been going on and on and on and on. Everybody, so uh, at the moment of birth, an African is taught and they learn that they're inferior at the moment of, of conception. The, you're, you're inferior, you're told that you're inferior. You watch movies, you're, you learn in history that you're inferior, you're always inferior. So the mindset you build, so this problem I think is psychological. Uh, so, uh, and psychological in a way that you don't create the psychology. The psychology is created for you. You don't, you actually don't say that I'm inferior. No, but you think that you're inferior. You don't say you're inferior. You think you're inferior. That's deep, man. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that. When, when I first came in, just to say something, when I first came into the U.S., right, so I had this thought that white people are inherently intelligent because, you know, back home, if someone does something intelligent or they speak good English, they say, you know, you're, you, you, uh, you are behaving like Muzungu, which is a prestigious title. Yeah. So, and then, yeah. <laughs> and then when I came to the States, I was taking um, animal science because, you know, as an agriculture major, I need to take animal science. And animal science was technically repeating what I studied in biology in form two. So it was very okay. easy for me. So when the, we did a test, I think midterm, and I think I got a 96 out of 100. And there was a student who had 56 and another student had 63 and we were all sitting on the same table. So when I got my paper, you know, back home, when you get your paper, you, you know, you keep it away. But for them, you know, they look, they compare, yeah. what did you get? And then, so she asked me that, hey, what did you get? So I saw their paper, they got 57. I can't say I got 96. So I, I say, well, I got 73, right? And then the other person was like, no, 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 he got 96. Here is his paper. And then they saw it and they were like kind of upset. So, you know, before that class, I knew I was inherently going to fail that class because I was black and I was African and I was less intelligent. Then I got to the class and realized that actually, you know, being able to perform academically has nothing to do with your race. It's just yeah. your ability to comprehend things. And there are things that I don't do well in, not because I am black or African, it's just because I just don't do well in them. And then someone can do well in them based on their ability to do that. But I do agree that most people back home, they are taught to believe that white is, rel is highly related to or close to intelligence and, you know, doing good things as opposed to being black. And we want to add on that. It's not only black people that are taught that they are inferior. It's that also white people are taught that they're superior. So it goes both ways. It goes both ways. Someone is born, they, are say, they, they feel superior. They are told they are superior. They are told they are superior. So for us, it's, we are born, we are told we are inferior. So the chain goes on, the chain goes on. Everybody inherits the same mindset. So uh, th this thing, uh, uh, Dr. I think, I, I, I think Dr. I don't know how to pronounce his name right. Um, Dr. Fiacre. Uh, yeah, he said. He said uh, this thing is not meant to end. It's meant to be there. So no, I no, I serve. I I get the point. No, I, and I, I no, it's not. There's no there's no contradictions really here. May, you know, we're not on the fundamentals here. There's a problem we're discussing. So what explains this? Um, lack of difference so why can have we not been able to achieve these things that we are concerned with so the problem the one way to begin to think about it is so let's create a framework is the problem internal or external you know that's one way you can begin at least to have a framework okay so another one would be is the problem structural or cultural just to you know cultural the idea that Oh. Africans are doomed, you know, where there's just, uh, you know, there's no way we, we handle this, the, which is a side of how we have been portrayed before. Uh, no, but there's also another alternative way of beginning to think. Maybe it's both or neither, 
neither of the two. But you're right to the extent that you know, we see the problem, we can complain about it, and we can blame, we can place blame onto that history of subjugation or that history of colonialism. But there are many other nations on in the world as a counter argument to that, that too were, or were colonized. You know, the example has been Ghana versus South Korea in the 60s. They both had, you know, fam you know, famously, the comparison holds that they both had, uh, on, uh, on aggregate, about the same size of the population, if you consider that demographics is one component to, to measure development as an asset toward development. They both uh, de depended on a foreign aid and service based economy. They have both been colonized and occupied. Uh, the GDP per capita around that, they both around the 60s was around $300 uh, both countries. So, and more and more, and they're also demographically more homogeneous. So really you can say there is, you know, fundamentally, you know, these are different people you know, and who migrated and mixed and became just a mismatch like in the United States. No, more or less. So ideologically, you can say there will be a harmony in terms of how you wield this ideology to, de to drive development. But look at what they have each become 30 years later. So what accounts for these two diametrically opposed directions as far as development? Has uh, South Korea, have South Koreans been outsmarted the Western system in order to achieve development and join the club of giants in the world. The GDP per capita in South Korea now is around $30,000. Ghana, they're around $900. So you can say everything, you know, we can say everything we want and say, yeah, psychology, you know, which is actually, to my surprise, you know, what you said, we've been psychologically messed up, you know, we're screwed because <laughs> no, our psychology was just told, was shaped in such a way we never see ourselves as worthy, you know, in, of any praise and we're not intelligent, which is the same narrative as, you know, the racist that Europeans still hold against Africans. By the way, our fellow brothers and sisters who are Black Americans also, we have these stereotypes. They, come, they go to Africa and say, Oh yeah, they've been brainwashed. There's no a sense of compass in as far as who they are, the cultural identity for Africans. You don't find it in Africa. There's no one way you can say, yo, yeah. they resist. So we don't have that. You know, yeah, I want to let it, Duncan Chando. I think you're finishing a point. I didn't want to cut you off, but I want to let Duncan, are you there? Duncan? It's not there, so you can finish. Because we, I've got to leave in a box. something real quick. Actually. Okay. Oh, go yes, ahead. yes I, please. I'm not, uh, I mean, I'm not an economist. Hello? I'm yeah. not an economist. Is Duncan there? Let the person go. Let the Duncan person go. Yeah, Duncan, go in. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. here. You lived in Europe. You hear this discussion, where it's going. So give us your summary of it. I'm going to leave in about five minutes, so. Yes. <laughs> I have to be somewhere. So go ahead, Duncan. Uh, no, I, I think based on, based on my experience, uh, I mean, when you talk about racism, uh, the truth is, I think the whole aspect of, uh, of anti-migrant uh, rhetoric is also fueling this because, you know, there's this notion that um, maybe people are coming to take over, you know, like, I'll give you an example, for example, a country like, like Denmark, you know, is a population of 5 million people. So there's this fear and then there's this growing nationalism that people feel like, okay, if you're not a Dane, you, 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 you can't move in here. And they feel, for example, I mean, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of Somalis who went to Denmark. And these Somalis, you know, they give back to a lot of kids, like five, six kids. And then there's this notion that maybe in the next five or 10 years, these guys will, 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 will overtake us because you find a normal Dan fa Danish family they give birth to maybe one or two kids. 
and this is a population of 5 million people. So when they see new people, when they see refugees moving in, when they see, uh, when they see, I mean, some of these migrants moving in, so there's this fear. And then the kids are also told the same because, I mean, there are cases whereby you, you find even, they, they don't even take their kids to play with the, with the kids of, uh, of, of, of people from, from other countries. Another thing also, they have this, the notion of ghetto, you know. So the ghettos, normally where they consider ghetto is where a lot of uh, migrants live. Because what happened when people start moving into a locality, then the Danish people will move out of that locality. So the, 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 and then the rent of that place will go down. So then when the rent is a little bit lower, then they say that is a ghetto. So they call it a ghetto. So, so now it's called I ghetto. Rob yes, and Dr. Bienvin were talking about this concept of uh, if Oginga asked this question that if Africa is developed, yes. let's say Somalia is stable and Somalia is well yes. and it's gaining yes. clout in the international community, do you think yes. that the respect level for the Danish people, for the Somali, will increase? That's essentially. I, mean, I, I don't think that. I don't think so because you know there's this notion that um, when they see when when people hear about Africa and the way Africa is also being taught in Europe, that's another thing that I, that I came to realize. You know, they taught Africa as a whole. You know, they don't say like Kenya, they don't say I mean they don't say Ethiopia, they don't say Nigeria, they say Africa. So when people say Africa, and then the other thing is the way they portray Africa in terms of, for example, a lot of these international organizations when they do fundraising, they portray like some people live in, in, in the bush. I mean, I've, I've had a, a little bit of a problem with, with some of my colleagues who, when, when people do fundraising and they try to portray like some hungry kids somewhere, some people living in the forest. I, I can give you a very interesting example. When I went to South Korea in 2011, then I met some Korean friends and they were like, ah, do you have Facebook in, in Africa? You know, do you have Facebook? I, I, I'm on Facebook. I want to, mm -hmm. I want us to connect, but I wanted to know, do you have Facebook in Africa? You know, so there's this notion that uh, I've been portrayed there, you know, as it's also a socialization process. You know, it's very difficult to, to socialize someone, you know, some of these things are taught and what they, what, what they see in their school books and it, it builds on these. But again, uh, colonialism also plays a very key role because you know, when Europeans colonize African countries, so they feel that they are superior, you know, with this superiority that comes with it. So in as much as uh, we might have some level of development or uh, like uh, one person also mentioned in terms of even our academic uh, performance, it sometimes offends them. I had a similar, uh, uh, I mean, experience whereby I was in a class and, uh, and, and this class where I was studying in South Korea and uh, this class, you find that uh, there are some lecturers who are, who are, who are they were favor they were, they were favoring the, the, the Korean students because they were saying, you know, you guys are already here on scholarship, so you know the Koreans need to score. So you can never get an A in that class. You can only you can only score a B because a, the school policy also demands that there should be a curve. So with these, in as much as most African countries will be developed, and even from my own experience, you find that. I mean, some African. I mean, some of us we live much better than some 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 places in Europe. To be to to, to tell you the truth, I mean, there are people who live way way much in a, in, a, in a difficult situation that than most of us Africans. So, I think the whole issue of um, what what the media portrays that's one. Secondly, I think also uh, it's also a business because I mean, having worked in the humanitarian development sector, also this is also a business because. Some of these very stable countries, a country like Denmark, you know, they sell guns, they manufacture guns, you know. So it's also a way of them to survive. I mean, they claim they're the happiest people, they are the happiest country, but in the, in the, in the, in the long run, if, if you dig deep where is their wealth coming from, they're very wealthy, but there's a lot of exploitation going on. I don't know I can say. So even in as much as we'll be well-developed right now, a country like Switzerland, they own 90% of the gold. Where is the gold coming from? They come from the Congo, you know? And some of these people sponsor some of these. So it's a little bit tricky in as much as development might go on, but I think what uh, what people believe is a bit difficult to, to get yeah. rid of. Yeah, excuse me, excuse oh, me, can I? Okay. Oh. Uh, 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 I wanted to say something on that. Uh, I think this is something that 
uh, everybody should consider. Uh, when you draw a map of the world, uh, uh, all the European countries, American countries are on the top uh, and Africa is at the bottom. Uh, so uh, uh, if, if I say that I, I give you a number, uh, let's say I show you number three, uh, when you walk, you see number three. When you sleep, you see number three. Uh, when you listen to something, you hear number three. Number three imprints in your mind. So what I want to say is, uh, it's it's imprinted. Uh, the, uh, we could just, if we wanted, if we wanted, no, this is actually funny. Uh, if we wanted to say, that, let's say we put Africa on top, we could just uh, put the map upside down and Africa is on top, boom. But it's always at the bottom. So it's actually goes back to the framework. Actually, it, it was built like that. Hmm. A very pessimistic. Professor Le uh, uh, Asian. Yeah, that's interesting um, point to make. But I wanted to quickly say that I'm not an economist, but I, I, I feel like history always tells us something. All right. So wherever question is it, what your name again is what? Fiaker? Fiaker? Yes. It's okay, Fiaker. so Fiaka, the, the question is raised is one of the best questions I think we've been confronted with today because it's about the tomorrow of Africa, the today of Africa. All right, where do we go from here type of question. But the same question was raised by some African leaders before, during their, their lifetime. Kwame Nkrumah and the rest raised the same question. All right, they talked about, there is this book by Nkrumah that talks about, it's, it's called, um, Neocolonialism is the last stage of imperialism. All right. So these were African leaders who saw the writing on the wall. They said, listen, we, are, we shouldn't be very comfortable about independent. I mean, it's good to start with independence. We need to get rid of these Europeans, take over our continent. But on the independent day of Ghana, he makes the statement. He says, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's linked with the total liberation of Africa. And it's not just political liberation, but economic liberation too. So this is the individual and others like him who were saying, listen, let's create a United States of Africa. Because they saw what you are talking about. That these Europeans are not, they would never leave. They cannot survive with others. Look at the history. Look at South Africa, apartheid, whatever happened there. There are about 7% of the population, um, I mean, instituting um, apartheid. It's about survival, as one person said on the platform. But Africans have always sat down and waiting for other people to survive at their expense and oh. just watching the, the show. No taking, and our current leaders, especially, lack that knowledge. They don't, I don't think any of them understand what we are talking about when Nkrumah talks about neocolonialism. Most of them don't. Have you guys read a book by Dambisa Mo? You're talking about Dead Yeah. yeah. Right? It's, not, it's, not, it's not a perfect book, but the concept, whatever she's talking about, is what we are dealing with today. We don't need any aid. Somebody mentioned about Norway and other places, Denmark, where they make it look like I teach a course on global Africa, NGOs aid and all that. So, oh. so we talk about Dambisa Moyo. The whole I have very good knowledge of what happened in the past and how that keeps playing itself. If you don't remember the, pl the past, how Europeans treated you, how they came to your country, just pretended as if they cared about you, religion and several other things, to, to control you, and you think they are going to live today, then you are wasting your time. They need to survive too. So until we tell them, when we go to the drawing table, when we say that this is our mineral resources, this is what we want to do with it, we are screwed up. We need to get to the point where people like us, who, are, who have had all this opportunity talking about this subject, sending this information on social media, talk about it, any group of people, and guess what? Eventually, this younger generation will listen to us. They will listen to you. They can put the dot together. And maybe 10 years from now, somebody will say the same thing. It will be like, oh, wait a minute. Is it not the same thing that was said by this individual at this time? We have to plant that seed slowly. But our leaders have failed to go back to learn the mistake. That's why I like people like Mugabe. People hated him, but Mugabe is one of the few African leaders who was able to connect political independence to economic independence by demanding that he takes over all the land from white people. He didn't do it well, but at least the concept shows that he was thinking very far. And that's what we need to be talking about, very radical decisions. If we don't understand, if our leaders do not understand 
what the if they think um, the, the World Bank and the rest are the friends of Africa, then they are just wasting their time. These people are just there to loot. They give you subsidies. They cut off your subsidies, create conditions that makes it difficult for you yourself to run your own country. NGOs are there becoming the new governors. They are the new colonial powers that are running Africa. And these are the people we need to call them out. NGOs, people that talk about aid, we don't need aid. How many of you on this platform got any aid from Europe when you were living in Africa? How many of you? I didn't get anything. The rice that was brought, the claim was sent from the United States to Ghana. I didn't get any of it. It's even insulting and offensive for people living in the villages to be told that if Americans don't bring them a bag of rice, they won't survive. They go to their farm every day. What do they need from Americans? But that's yeah. the psychological, um, what, what this guy said, the psychology. You've been, they planted something in your head to make you believe. Europeans know, white people know that without Africa, they can't survive. How about they leave Africa? Tell them, let's go into an agreement. One year from now, all Europeans should leave Africa. Let Africans live there. And let's see who's going to survive. You remember what Bill Gates' wife said about um, COVID? He said Africans will be dropping in the streets. They will be dead. How dare she say such a thing about Africa? What happened in the end? Look at what's happening in the United States. What happened in the end? How many people are dead of COVID in Africa? And how did they survive? All right. So these are things we need to call people out, especially if we're using social media. Please be, you know, I'm not saying be, 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 be find a way to communicate what you want to communicate, but people should hear. And the religious people too, you should call them out. Because they are part of the problem that we have. They found ways to control the minds of Africans. Everything is yeah. about Christianity. Christianity. Yeah. People going to church, ministers lying to them. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. And that's part of the colonial legacy we are living with. Professor, we're gonna have, have to end it. We're gonna have to go to work. I wanted to, you have I, to go to I, work, go now. I wanted Just to go add now. one thing. Sorry, sorry. I wanted to add one thing here. Uh, uh, the thing I was saying about